and you are live. Thank you. Good morning. We'll be starting up here at the bottom of the hour, but uh, as you log in, you can get an updated handout on the link that's there. It's going to magically show up in the chat pod too. Um, and go find yourself a paper clip. And for those who weren't with us last week, we're going to be taking polls using the Poll Everywhere uh, app and or pollev.com. We'll be starting up in about two minutes. Okay, about another 30 seconds or so, we'll be starting up. And again, if you weren't with us last week, uh, we're using pollev.com forward slash David or PE, all one word, to do some polls and get to interaction. Uh, there's an update on the handout, which has some additional things dealing with thickness, which you can download at that website. It's also in the chat pod. And then finally, while you're waiting, go find yourself a paper clip and uh, check to make sure it's not serrated, if you would, please. The serrated paper clips don't work as well. OK. So good morning. I expect a few folks will join us in, hopefully not too late. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, just because I know your time is valuable. And so we'll be done here by noon this morning. Um, David Orr, I'm the director here at the L New York LTAP Center. Uh, so Cornell Local Roads program. So welcome very much to another l lovely day. It was a beautiful day this morning for a walk. Uh, a little warmer this weekend, but hopefully enjoyable. So today we're going to be talking about low volume road pavement thickness. Last week we talked about the geometry. Um, so just a couple of preliminaries before we get started. And so we're all on the same page. As folks are logging in, just as a reminder. Uh, 
you know, this is our typical webinar format. So a couple of things to remember. The chat, it, it still, you should open it up. That is a place where you can get links to our activities. We'll be putting some other links in here during the course of the morning. Uh, the updated handout, you can just click on that as opposed to having to type or search for something. And then also, uh, we'll be sending you messages that way. You can raise your hand now and then. Uh, I'll be using that feature just to ask questions when I'm not doing polls. And of course, the big one I would use a lot myself is please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I'd like them as we go. Uh, if you've got a question, I know somebody else probably does as well. So please use the Q&A, ask questions, and we can have ourselves a good day. Now, today's session is on low volume road thickness. Uh, well, ending the day, we'll be talking about a pavement design technique that we developed with the University Transportation Center out of Region 1, which is hosted at Rutgers. We're a part of that group. And it was designed for low volume roads. And it matches up with the 2,000 vehicles a day that we talked about for geometry last week. So you can use it on most of your roads, but there are limitations. And we'll talk about those before the end of the day. So this First hour, we'll be talking about how pavements actually work and how they fail structurally, because it is a structure. Uh, then we're going to be talking about the inputs for pavement design and the techniques for pavement design. Then we're going to finish up with, again, this technique for designing the thickness of your pavements, because we found that most pavements typically are either too thin or too thick, and how do we get it just right? Um, and we'll end, of course, with a case study and a few questions for PDHs. For those who are getting PDHs, only the person who signed in uh, will get those PDHs. Um, and what will happen is if you come to three quarters or more of this morning, you'll get a justice certificate of attendance. If you're more than 90% of the three hours, you'll get a PDH if you requested one. Now, I know most of you are overlaps from last week, but just to help me out and to make sure everybody's on board with road P with the P the poleev.com can't talk this morning. Just uh, put it in there who you work for. Uh, you work for a local government, town, county, city, village, uh, state, federal highway, uh, contractor. And if you don't have PolEV, if you just can't get that to work, you can put the answer into the Q&A. We can take advantage of that. Again, Let's. I want to make this as user-friendly as is possible in this world of the virtual. So. Uh, so the vote, folks who voted, about three quarters of you said uh, local government, though I do have a couple of folks in the Q&A who said uh, consultant. So local government and consultant, okay. So obviously most of you are designing or working on local or low volume roads. So let's talk about that a little bit. Now we talked about this last week, um, but again, I just want to see what your thoughts are. It'll help me. I've already got some thoughts about how we're going to do today anyway with the attendees we've got. But if I said, what is a low volume road after last week's session and your own thoughts, one word, this is what we had last week. Okay. So we had rural and all that stuff. But has it changed? What word would you use? I'm going to clear the responses and let you do this again. What, what one word did you think of when you thought of low volume road? Go ahead. What do you think? What one word would you think of for low volume roads? It would help if I hit the activate button so you can actually type your answers in. So sorry about that. Try that. Try it now. Minimal, yeah, yeah, that's actually probably a pretty good word to use for low volume. Um, we're usually designed to a minimum standard, yeah, especially when it comes to thickness, yeah. What else would you use for low volume roads? Less than 400 vehicles a day. And that's, that's the cutoff we most commonly see. There's a big debate about that. Uh, we're, the method I'm going to show you is up to about 2,000, 
But again, even then, there's limitations. You start to get towards the edge of that 2000, you really probably need to know what the traffic is before you make that decision. And one vehicle can actually exceed the capacity of the roadway in some cases. Uh, so that's something to think about. Yeah. What else makes a low volume road, especially when it comes to the thickness of the roadway? What other words would you might, might you use? And again, if you don't have access to pull EV, I'm more than willing to have you put them into the Q&A. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. Okay, not getting a lot of answers this morning. There we go. Less, yeah, less and less. Lean, and lean, that's actually another good one to think about. But one of the other things, a low volume or especially when it comes to thickness is they're lean or thin. And what that really comes down to is every layer is important. And in some respects, the quality of the gravels and the materials we use in a low volume road are more important than they are on a state highway. And we'll come back to that as we go through the course of today. Okay. And yes, they tend to be narrow. Okay. And we talked a lot about that last week with the geometry section. So just a little bit on low volume roads and streets, a reminder from last week, it encompasses a large range. Uh, it might be an old state highway as uh, this is one out of Lewis County. It was widened over time, but it's still probably low volume in a lot of ways. Um, it could be a one lane gravel road. I live on a one lane gravel road. Um, in fact, this is actually goes up by my house. That Presithia you see in the distance is uh, one at the edge of my property. Uh, that I have to trim, keep it low enough to see around it. Um, it could be out in the country. Uh, this is also up in Lewis County. This is a town road. A lot of people think of gravel. And it could be gravel. It doesn't have to be. But, you know, it may be carrying some pretty hefty loads. This particular road was, uh, I took the photograph when we were up, when they were putting in the windmills up there, and some pretty hefty loads. So the road needs to be able to handle the loads that are placed upon it. And of course, it could be in an urban area. Uh, you know, it could be a village. Uh, either the main road, even in some villages, are still going to be fairly low in terms of volume. It depends on the traffic mixture. And as I said, it could be one vehicle, the wrong vehicle, and throws everything we're talking about out. Uh, <laughs> this is out of uh, Iowa, uh, Lee County, Iowa. Ben Hull is the uh, highway official out there. And that particular bogey, if you look at it, you can see there's, uh, I think I counted 18 of these bogies, and there are eight wheels on each one. Uh, this one has to be designed separately, and every structure has to be looked at carefully, and those are extremely heavy loads. What we're talking about today is not this kind of design, but it is something to keep in mind that a lot of times we do get some pretty hefty loads on some low volume roads, so keep that in mind. You still can do some things, but you have to be aware of why roads survive and fail. And the time of year can make a huge difference of when you move these loads, especially here in New York State. So what I really want to do is spend this first hour together, how pavements fail structurally. And if at nothing else, I hope you walk away with the understanding that pavements are a structure. We don't typically design our pavements, which is too bad. We really should be designing them more. We'll talk about how people do that to account for the loads that are upon it. And part of the reason we don't do that is it's hard to define when they fail. Now, I'm starting to do it again. I actually have spent the uh, last couple of days uh, in my office at work. I'm at home today because I have a better computer at home. I'm working on that, but it's gonna take a while. Um, so this is my commute. I walk to work. And I walk across uh, State Highway City Street, uh, one of these classic roads that's maintained by the city but has a state route number on it. And the question would be, has that road failed structurally? Now, as I cross the street, you can actually see this was a few years ago before they did some work on it. And you can see that pothole that's in there. And in our pavement maintenance class, we'd like to talk about the fact that this is a failed roadway. Most people would think this has failed, and if you ride a motorcycle, 
I uh, think you're probably a degree. This is a failed roadway. You hit that with your motorcycle, it's going to be a really bad day. But you can still go down it. You could still work your way down some pretty mangled, pretty beat up roadway. So it's really hard sometimes to define what is failure. Now, I didn't put this in as a poll, um, and we'll come back to it. But in the Q&A, somebody give me what you would define as a failure on a roadway. What, what defines a roadway that has failed structurally? Okay, I didn't do this one as a poll, uh, just in the Q&A. Just give me an answer. What do you think is a failure for a low volume road? See, let's see what y'all come up with. How would you define a failure of a low volume road structurally? It could be wheel rutting. It could be movement of the surface of the subgrade, pushing and shoving, okay? And how much of that is a debate. We could debate that. But yeah, rutting, uh, a certain amount of potholes, a certain amount of cracking, all of these things have been used as definitions of failure. And so it's something we have to keep in mind. One thing you can actually think about a little bit is economics. A rough road actually cost us more money, okay? The smoother the road, the cheaper it is. And there are some people who actually think we should use that as a driving force for when we've defined failure. The only thing that's a little bit risky with that is that a badly cracked roadway that all of us would agree is probably failed and ready to pothole can actually be relatively smooth. And so... It is not a bad way to think about it, but a rough road does cost us money. And of course, at some point, I think we can all agree this is a road that has failed, okay? And it's a pretty low volume. In fact, right now, its volume is zero because uh, vehicles are going to get stuck if they try to go down it. Uh, this is from a little over 100 years ago. So last week, we talked about what is a road from geometry, getting people moving goods and services. But from a structural standpoint, I'm going to ask the same question. So this is what we talked about last week. Okay. So I'm going to clear the responses. From a structural standpoint, what is a road? So let's again, and poll EV, or again, if you don't have poll EV, you can put it in the Q&A. What is a road? How would you define what is a road? a road. Stabilized surface for transport. Okay. Yep. Stable base, stabilized surface to support loading, aka, whoop, went too far. Come on back. Uh, traffic, etc. Yeah. Yeah, that's a possibility. Okay. So from a structural standpoint, it's, it's, a, it's a traveled way. It's to carry those loads. So we don't see like we saw in the previous picture. It is a structure, okay? And so, you know, if we think about that, we usually build that roadway up from the bottom. Now, we normally strip the organics off. And once you've stripped off the organic layers, the A and the B layers, you're down to the C layer of soil, which has no organics in it. And to confuse everybody, we call it the subgrade. It's not the slope, it's the native soil though it should have a grade to it. So maybe it's sort of a nice dual definition, but we've got a subgrade. On top of that subgrade, we put a sub base sometimes if it needs it. And certainly a state highway is gonna have a sub base. The state actually always uses the sub base. Usually it's granular. And then we have a base and we have a surface. And even on a gravel road, you need to have a structure. Now for most low volume roads, one thing that makes a low volume road a little bit different is we typically only have a base layer, okay? But very, very rarely do you see much more than that because, again, you don't usually need to spread the loads out that much for a low-volume road. But that makes that base even more critical because it's going to be carrying more of the loadway. Um, 
So if we look at the loads on a road, here's a wheel coming down. It's pushing down into the pavement, and we're spreading that load out on the subgrade. And then a lot of the older design methods, in fact, the early design methods, one of the ideas was, let's just reduce the stress and the strain on the subgrade, the native material, enough to where we don't have problems. Spread that load out, and we solve the problem. We build a pavement up for that purpose. And in a lot of ways, the New York State DOT's design method actually takes advantage of that concept, that you build enough pavement structure so you don't overload the subgrade. And that's why they like to do that select fill and replace uh, some of the subgrade with that select fill now and then. But what we found over time is, is what really happens is pavements deflect. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And when they do that, they begin to stretch and they crack. Okay, so they go up, they go down. Every time they go up and go down, they bend a little bit. Okay, now we're going to show a video. If you've seen many of my talks, you've probably seen this video before. Um, but it's, it's definitely worth sharing it again, just because it's such a critical illustration of how roadways work. And we'll see if the video decides to play. Here we go. This was done by the U.S. Forest Service out west at a place called West Track. And watch the two green dots. And you can see how the pavement actually moves. Now, this particular roadway was designed to fail. And you can see it has a high water table, a very thin, poor quality sub material or base gravel. OK. And of course, uh, the internet is being slow with me this morning, so I apologize for the digitization stuff there. But that particular pavement lasted for 81 passes of these fully loaded trucks. Now, they were multi-axles. They were double tandem. So maybe we could double the number of trucks. But 200 trucks before you saw this is not really a good pavement design. But that was actually a perfect one in this case because they wanted it to fail. They were doing research. They wanted to see what happened. The U.S. Forest Service is really concerned about heavy loads on thin roads because of logging. And a lot of our roads, that's what's going on. We're getting heavy loads. And so how do you design for that? Well, it turns out what you can see is that bending is what we care about. And the more bending, the faster the pavement's going to break down. And it's a lot like our paper clip. Okay. So we're going to do a little exercise. There's uh, not a lot of us today. So that's okay. This will work out pretty well. We're going to do a little exercise in pavement fatigue. And we're going to do this by illustrating the concept using a paper clip. Okay, now so today, because this is how they list it, uh, let's just see here. If your first name starts with the letter J, um, I want you, you're going to be the 90%. I'll give you your instructions in just a second. So J is 90%. M, okay, is going to be uh, 180. So if you've got an M, for your first name, that's going to be 180 degrees. And if you are D or T, yes, I can see the listing, you're 45 degrees. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your paper clip and you're going to bend it out till you see that drawing that matches. Okay, so the 45 would just look like a 45 degree angle. And then you're going to bend it back to its original configuration and count that as one cycle. So like one pass of a truck. And I want you to keep doing that until your paper clip breaks. And you want to tell me what cycle did it fail on? Did you, you know, did it fail on cycle 20? Did it fail on, fail on cycle 22, 10, 85, whatever? Okay. So let everybody start doing that, destroying your paper clip. And meanwhile, I'm going to open up a spreadsheet and I'm actually going to blow it up a little bit more while I'm waiting for your answers. OK. And if we could get uh, three answers for each of these, that would be cool. I'll put my paper clip back. And you can just put that in the Q&A. Um, when you do that, put in your angle, so 45, and then a dash, how many cycles? If you're 90, 90 dash, how many cycles, and so on. OK. So 180 and 20. Perfect. 
And obviously the 180s are going to be faster than the rest of us, as you might expect, because they're bending it more. Higher stress, higher strain, more cycles to failure. Okay. Okay. So we got a hundred. We got the hundred eighties. We got three of them. So your M's are lucky today. You guys got uh, lucky. So ninety. We got a twenty-three. Okay. Uh, ninety and a twenty-eight. I'm making the T and D's for count a lot today. Okay. Forty-five and twenty-five. Uh, I'm assuming since you're an M, Michael, you're a 15, you're 180, 176. You bought yourself some good uh, paper clips there. 30. Okay. A large clip, you got 34. Okay. We'll try to keep them about the same. And that 176 might have been the same. Who knows? Okay. Seem to get, uh, so we got three of each. And it's quite a variation. Now, I've done this game and this exercise lots of times. Um, in this particular case, pretty tight banding, but we got one that's way outside. In the world of statistics, we may or may not throw that particular one out. Um, just for the sake of argument, I'm going to open up one we did that has a little bit more data in it. Okay. This is one we did uh, last time that I did this class. Let me just zoom in here a little bit. Actually, no, that's right. This is the one that I did with uh, in our laboratory. I forgot. Yeah, this is the one we did in our laboratory just to have data as a backup. Um, whether we looked at your data, which is pretty good, pretty consistent other than that one, or we look at the data that I collect in the laboratory, you'll notice there's a slope to this line. And it's in a log log space and you're going, huh, oh, Dave, logs, I don't even remember logs. It it's, goes back to high school, you all know logs. It's actually not that bad. Uh, essentially, if you just think about it, what it really says is, is Every time you get stronger and stronger bends, it really makes a big difference more than anything else. The reason we do that log log space is because it flattens it out. It makes it actually a straight line rather than being a curve, which is hard to really understand. A straight line, we can do a plot of that straight line and it's really pretty easy and pretty simple. Okay, and the slope of that line makes a big difference. Why didn't I get exactly the same data? Even when we did it in the laboratory, where I had paper clips from the exact same batch, and I bent them very carefully each time to exactly 45, 90, and 180 degrees. How come even this data that I did ourselves isn't nice and clean and neat? Why, what do you think happened? Why did it not have just, I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't they have all fall exactly on the same line? What, what do you think actually happened here? Again, give me a couple of thoughts in, you, in the Q&A. Even if I've got a drawing in front of me and I try to do it as close as I can. Yeah, Dan, you're right. It, it, it's not exactly the same. My loading isn't exactly the same. Trucks aren't going to be exactly the same. Michael, you're right. It could be differing material. We thought the paper clip was, you know, a 32nd of an inch in diameter but it's not going to be exactly manufacturing differences are different. So it's not going to be exactly the same. And when you build a roadway, you thought you put in 12 inches of gravel and four inches of asphalt, but uh, it might be three and a half inches of asphalt or 14 inches of gravel. It's going to have different
different characteristics. And of course, in a paperclip, it's a controlled environment, not that much changes, but in the real world in a pavement, those differences could actually just be caused by moisture changes. During spring thaw, everything staying exactly the same, you're gonna get a different cycle to failure because like it or not, <laughs> pavements bend more when they're wet. So seasonality makes a big difference with a pavement. And the slope of that line is something we'll talk about quite a bit. It's pretty important. So let's go back to our slide deck. Okay. And we'll scroll to the next page. And we'll talk about the idea of what's called the fatigue failure criteria. And we use this in metals all the time. In fact, we use it with bridges. We actually check bridges. Those of you on the consulting side do bridge work, you know you check steel for fatigue. And when you're checking steel for fatigue, you develop something known as, let's see if my pen, oh, forgot to turn my pen back on. Something called an SN curve, okay? In the nature of steel, we look at it from the standpoint of stress, how much stress is the metal under, and N is the number of cycles to failure. With a pavement, it turns out, that same fatigue concept works but rather than having the S stand for stress, it stands for strain. The amount of bending is as important as the stress itself because pavement materials tend to be resilient. And so therefore the stress alone isn't usually enough. It's the strain that really makes the bigger difference. But it's still an S in curve. It still has a nice straight line and it's a log log space. So these are exponents that occur in the log space, okay? And we have to account for the strain and we have to account for the moduli, the strength or stiffness, really even a better definition of the various layers, okay? And so we'll come back to that. And that's a concept that we have actually used since the 50s, but we didn't really quite use it as directly as we are using today. But the idea of a strain-based failure criteria and the key, of course, is the location of the critical strains are the places where you get the most bending. So in the case of on top of the subgrade, somebody had mentioned earlier rutting. And of course, rutting really matters. So we care about the vertical strain on the subgrade. You get enough of it and it doesn't behave resilient anymore and it begins to rut and the ruts become permanent. So that's one location that's really critical. And that's typically right under or real close to being under the load. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The other one that we care about is the tension in the bottom of any surface layers that are pulling on it. Even in a gravel, we care about that, though we care more usually about the subgrade rutting, even on a gravel roadway. You can also get tension, by the way, at the surface. And I only am showing this, you know, a cross section. We actually will get some tension right at the edge of the wheel with radial tires, and you can actually get cracking due to this kind of tension in the asphalt layers. And that's actually the criterion that we deal with is the cracking in the surface due to these tensions that occur. So the two most common criterion are the tensile strain in the surface, i.e. cracking, and the vertical strain on the subgrade, i.e. rutting, okay? Now, there are other issues you have to deal with. There's issues in the base. There's long-term aging. There's lots of other factors, but when it comes to low volume roads, we can use these two and get a pretty good design. We don't have to have the long litany of possible failures that you might see if you were designing a higher volume or an interstate highway. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But if we look at the strain criterion in that SN curve concept, Okay, there has been research done on this since the original ASHO road test by folks in the United States, Canada, Europe, all over the world. And they all have different coefficients and different criterion for failure. This is for the asphalt horizontal tensile or pulling strain. And you can plot all these and get your average coefficients. Okay. And you can see what's going on here and what's these average coefficients were developed by our previous director, Lynn Irwin. He collected them, he put them together, he came up with an average. 
for all of these things. There's a more modern pavement design we'll talk about a little bit here called the Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide from AASHTO. And that particular design guide has a slope that's right in the middle, okay? So it turns out all these criteria are pretty close to each other. And if you look at the average for all of these things put together, the slope that you might come up with is a slope of 3.9492. Now, there's three problems I have with that number, though we are going to use it. <laughs> We're going to use it because it's empirical. Uh, the concept is empirical. In other words, we use just a whole bunch of data and come up with a criterion. It's not pure science. That's what engineers, that's what we like to do. What do you think I don't like about that 3.9492? What, what, what's actually a problem with that? Why, why is 3.9492 a problematic number? Let's see if somebody can tell me what's wrong with that one. A challenge, isn't it? So why why doesn't Dave like that number? Well, the reason I don't like that number is twofold. Number one is it's too many digits. Do I really believe 3.9492? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> uh, my my the truth be told, I think the best we could probably say is 3.94 or 3.95, probably 3.95. And if you start looking at the actual science behind this and you start reading and thinking about the, how the stresses and the strains work within a layered system, and I'm not going to get into the math of that, that number there, rather than being 3.9492, probably should be 4.0. It actually turns out it probably is what's known as a fourth power equation. Okay. So what that really means, and this is the thing I really want to get you to remember and think about is that that log log slope is really close to four. So that means that if you double the strain, the number of cycles to failure gets cut in a log log space by that number to the fourth. So two to the fourth, so we double the strain. So we go from 100 to 200 or 200 to 300. You double the strain, you get two to the fourth or 16 times the damage or 1 16th the allowable number of cycles to failure. Okay. That's the thing I really want you to think about and keep in the back of your brain. It's really close to four. And I suspect over time, as we start analyzing all these things, we're going to find that that's really probably true. It's going to be closer and closer to four. It's over the years, that's what's actually happened. So that means if you go from a three-ton car to a 30-ton truck, so I'll put the car on the bottom of my equation when my pen decides to wake up, to a 30-ton truck, that's equal to 10. not exactly linear. We'll talk about why later. But if I take 10 to the fourth, I get 10,000. Okay. And my pen has decided to be persnickety right now. There we go. Okay. 10,000. Now, a truck going by a single location does not cause 10,000 times the damage because it has more wheels, it's got a lot more axles. So the real number is four to 6,000, but it's still huge. A fully loaded dump truck is gonna do a lot more damage on a pavement than a car. So last week when we talked about geometry, it was the car that drove a lot of what we do. And we had to account for 
the trucks and the buses for the width so that we could get the trucks and the buses down the roadway. But really it's the car that defines a lot of geometry. With thickness, the trucks define everything and the cars are secondary, even on the interstate system where cars are 95% of the mixture or more, it's still the trucks that define the design. And we'll talk about that quite a bit. Now, when it comes to the uh, gravel or the subgrade, uh, the vertical compressive strain, again, a series of lines and that slope really, really close to four, okay? <laughs> uh, 3.902, and again, uh, probably 3.90 is about the best we can do. And my gut instinct over time is that number is going to be coming closer and closer to four. And probably by the time I retire or shortly thereafter, we'll probably modify these things again. Okay. So how do we use that? How do we take advantage of that? Do we know that this is a strain based? We know the slope is about four, but how do we do that into design? Because at the end of the day, you don't care about all this. What you care about is, how much asphalt do I need to put down? How much gravel do I need? Okay. So what we're going to do is convert that strain into design predictions. Okay. So what we can do is rewrite the equation so that the number of cycles to failure allowable in sub F, that's a number we'll see a lot again and again and again, number of cycles to failure is all of these coefficients. And the one we really care about is this A coefficient, okay? Come on. The A coefficient here. And by the way, I don't know why this A should be, it should be a B, okay? So it's the strain raised to some slope, which is around four, and then the asphalt thickness strength makes a bit of a difference too, because a stiffer asphalt actually tends to crack faster one of the weird things about it, but it carries more strain. So it's a weird relationship. Don't, don't lose too much sleep over the B value. Uh, you can use the computer to do a lot of that. But what I do care about is bigger loads goes faster. So I can calculate that micro strain. And yes, we're using micro strains. The bending usually isn't that much. So as an example in uh, pavement, which is about six inches of asphalt and 12 inches of gravel, over a normal type subgrade we see in most of New York State. I can calculate that out. We'll talk about how and why in a little while, but I can calculate that out and I would get about, oh, half a million for PSI. Say it's a cool day like this morning, put in my coefficients and I calculate the number of cycles to failure for a 36 kip dual tandem axle dump truck. Okay. Now, for those of you who've used the AASHTO design guide with, uh, layer coefficients and moduli, and we'll talk more about that after our break. This is what they're doing. Uh, the term ESAL, you'll hear the term ESAL, I'll use that term again, equivalent single axle load, actually uses this same concept. And it actually has a very similar slope around four in terms of converting wheel loads to the amount of strain, the amount of damage, the amount of thickness we need, okay? And so we can do that for the asphalt. We can do that for the subgrade. The equation in the subgrade is a little simpler. Uh, there's a big debate about this. Um, does the strength of the subgrade make a difference? I'm of the opinion it does, but there isn't an agreement on this. So we're using an average value um, at the moment, but the tool that I'm gonna show you uh, is open. If things change, we'll change the tool, but it still gets us pretty close. So we can do the same thing. Put your numbers in the equation. You don't need to know all these, but you would calculate it out. Here's the thing I do want you to think about, however. When you're designing a pavement, you have to check both the surface strain, the cracking, and the subgrade strain, the rutting, for your low volume road. Which of those two do you want to have happen? If you're designing a low volume roadway or even a high volume roadway, and you're trying to decide, do you want the road to fail in cracking or do you want the road to fail in rutting? Which do you prefer? 
Would you rather have a road fail in rutting or fail in cracking? And you could put that in the uh, BC in the uh, Q and A for me. Which would you prefer? And if you can, tell me why. Cracking, yeah. When we design a pavement, we really do want it to fail in cracking because it's a lot easier to mill off the cracked surface and replace it than to try to get down to where the rutting is because that rutting is usually pretty deep. So yeah, so when we're designing pavements, we actually think about that. And you may have heard a term called perpetual pavement. The idea behind the perpetual pavement uh, is to design it so the surface cracks and it cracks in such a way that you just do mill and fills literally forever. You keep the strain amounts low enough in the lower layers that it, you don't have a problem. And it's pretty cool. It actually works. And here's what's cool about it. When it first came out, everybody says, ooh, it's fancy. It's scientific. It's European. The idea is get stiffer as you get towards the surface. And then the most the stiffest layers at the top and the thicknesses are such that the cracking occurs at the surface. Let's see. Let's describe a pavement that would meet that criteria. Uh, a gravel base, a cold mix binder, and a hot mix top would meet that criteria almost perfectly. And what is one of the most common techniques we see on local roads around New York State, especially the county system? Granular base, cold mix binder, hot mix top. So you're actually doing perpetual pavement. You just may not realize it if you can get the thicknesses correct, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over here to a program. And when you download all this, we'll give you a link to download this stuff later on and play with it yourself. One of the things you'll get when you download all of this is, oh, by the way, you can get it in the handout, by the way. It's already in the handout. You can just open the handout up. And I'll show you that in a little bit too. But uh, the tool that comes with this called Road BC. Okay, you'll notice road shows up a lot in our little stuff. BC stands for back calculation, and I won't get into that too much today. But what it really is, it's a tool to analyze pavements that we used for some teaching in another class. But it allows you to put in your pavement, put in the loads, and it can tell you the stresses and strains that are on the pavement. Uh, at different places within the pavement, okay? And it's doing it in just a graphical form. It's actually a text-driven uh, tool back from the 60s called Chevlet. Chevlet is the Chevron Oil Corporation, um, and it's the Chevron Layered Analysis Program because it analyzes a layered system called pavement because back then, lots of the asphalt companies really cared about uh, this stuff because they could sell more petroleum. Uh, they were selling asphalt. It could be Chevron. It could be Shell. They, they've developed these tools out there. But what you can do is see the effect of the life of the pavement by changing something. So this kind of case, I have a pretty thick pavement. It's really probably not low volume. Eight inches thick of asphalt, 12 inches of gravel, 30 inches of a subgrade. This is more of a state highway kind of road. But I just want to show you, you can see the number of cycles to failure is down in the lifespan section. And the one that fails first is the surface. That's good. Um, and that's assuming everything's an easel, single type of vehicle, which we'll come back to why that's not really true. But 20 million cycles. Let's just take that asphalt layer and cut it in half, four inches. And I hit the go button. And it just takes a second. I cut the pavement in half. My lifespan didn't get cut in half. Remember, that slope is about a four. And so if you think about it, if it's a four and cut it in half, it should be about 1 16th. Now, it's not quite 1 16th, again, because of the way loads work. But it is a factor of less than 1 tenth the lifespan by just cutting it in half. Now my lifespan dropped down to under 2 million cycles. Okay. So thickness makes a huge difference. Now I'm going to go back to my original pavement. 
okay? And I'm going to, this time, I'm going to cut my gravel layer in half. And I'm going to hit the button. Again, the asphalt layer is doing a lot of the work, so it's more critical. But you still lose about 25% by the gravel being poor, OK? And watch this. One last thing, and we'll go back to our end up our hour here. Put this back to its original condition. So we got our 20 million cycles. I'm just going to take and get a poor quality gravel. So I've got 40,000 PSI, which is the stiffness of the gravel. That's actually a pretty good gravel. That's a clean gravel with good drainage. I'm going to cut that in half. I'm going to say I've got a an item four, which doesn't really exist as a spec. It's a little dirtier than it ought to be, and uh, doesn't have good drainage. So now when I hit the button and I put the number in, look at that. I went back to my original thickness. I put in 12 inches of gravel, but if I've got a poor quality gravel, even with a good asphalt surface on top of it, my number of cycles to failure is cut down by more than half just by changing the quality of the gravel. Okay, and that's with a fairly thick asphalt surface. As you get thinner asphalt surfaces, as we typically see on low volume roads, this becomes even more critical. So the quality of your gravel base on your low volume roads is absolutely critical. And so I want you to remember that as we go through the rest of our morning together. The gravel quality is maybe more critical on low volume road than it is on a state highway. Okay, so keep that in mind. So what I want to do is finish up our first hour together talking about why roads fail prematurely. Okay, so I'm going to go through almost every road. Actually, this is true, by the way, on bridges, trucks, buildings, you name it. There's usually a primary cause. There's lots of things that can happen, and a lot of times you have to have multiple things happen to have a severe fatal failure. But generally, if you go back to the beginning, there's usually one criterion that we missed that leads to the most egregious reason that the road or the structure fails prematurely. And those four items are the design, the construction, the materials, and the maintenance. Okay? So let's talk about those four, and I want to get your feedback if you can come up with some thoughts and ideas for each of these, and hopefully this will trigger your brain when you're doing your designs later on. So let's look at design. We'll start there, okay? And some people wouldn't think this is a design failure because this looks just like a maintenance problem. But when we are maintaining a roadway, the choice of maintenance is a design choice, okay? So what would you do for this particular roadway? What would be your repair here? And by the way, if you're wondering, that little spot that's here in the center of the photograph, that's water coming out of a pothole. So what would be your repair? Just looking at it visually. What do you think? Got to fix the drainage first. Good answer. I like it. Yeah, absolutely. Got to start with the drainage. Yep. Okay. But in terms of the pavement itself, let's assume we fix the drainage. Is this a candidate for a chip seal? Was it a candidate for crack repairs? I <laughs> uh, hope nobody would say yes. Uh, but maybe micropave, but be real careful. If this pavement is moving, that micropave won't last. It doesn't add any structural strength. So you may need to undercut the subgrade and replace the full section, okay? The one thing this is definitely not is a candidate for an overlay. And the sad part is the day after I took the photograph, they overlaid it. So the crack repaired it a couple of days ahead of this. Then they overlaid it, not giving enough time for the, whatever you call that repair to cure. And sure enough, it began to pothole and crack. And until they came in and did something much more extensive, this road had problems. So it's really important to understand what the right selection is to fix this particular roadway. So when it comes to the design of a roadway, 
The most common thing we see, especially because economic budgets are tight, is they're under design for the loads. You've got to build the road to handle the loads. Okay. You've got to account for the conditions. This happens quite often. You know, what's going on? What happens? Uh, do you have the right number of trucks? Do you have the right weights in your trucks? Uh, what's going on in the ground? What might or might not happen afterwards? What changes over time? You know, that could make a big difference for you. Okay. Changes after construction. You did everything right, but the traffic volume changed because suddenly that road was connecting or somebody bought in a large development or a windmill farm or a Walmart and all of a sudden there were loads. That is still a design issue. Sometimes you know about it, sometimes you don't, but that's a challenge for us. Okay. It could be a construction problem. Okay. Now this is that road I walked by before they did the major repair to actually fix it and really properly replace the base and get a good surface on it. But they patched this over the course of one winter. Three different agencies actually tried to patch this. I watched them. All three of them used the same pavement maintenance technique, throw and go. They just threw patch in and drove away. And in all three cases, it failed within 24 hours. And you can see the patch along the side of the roadway here. Okay. That actually is, in my mind, a construction failure. Um, so keep that in mind. No matter what we come up with for design, um, that is a problem. And yes, it's not a town road. Um, uh, this happens to be that road I told you that's a combination of multiple agencies. And one of the people who patched it was the university. Uh, because it was so bad, they actually had some extra patch and they went out and they threw it in. But of course, it didn't survive. That's still a construction issue in my mind, okay? So yeah, it's not a town road, but the idea for construction is do we have good workmanship? I don't care what your design is. If you don't build it correctly, it's gonna be a problem. You've gotta use the right equipment to do the job. So we've gotta use good design, but we have to build it properly. You know, if you're in a village or a city and you've got an old water system and you use a vibratory roller, you're going to find out where your old water lines might be, the hard way, the day or week after you've paid. So you got to use the right equipment to do the job, and you got to use it properly. You know, a backhoe bucket is not a hammer, but we see people use it as such all the time. So you got to have the right equipment to do the job and use it correctly. And then this is one that actually is it a design problem or is it a construction problem? Failure to follow plans. If there are no plans. I would say no plans is a design problem, but we got to make sure we have plans and we need to follow them. And if we aren't following them, we need to have good reasons why. And then I'm going to throw in here something that, again, there are a dozen of us today here on this training session. I would like to see more. How do we get people in the room? Because we need to make sure people are trained. Okay. There's an old phrase, if you train your people, they might leave. <laughs> what if you don't train them and they stay? So you need to make sure people are trained to do the job. That's a construction issue in a lot of ways. And then, of course, when you do the work uh, makes a difference. If you pave too late in the year, don't blame the asphalt. Uh, it's really a construction problem because it's too late. And the asphalt got too cold too quickly. You just can't build around weather. you got to deal with reality. Okay, it could be a materials problem. Um, the most common materials problem we see traveling around New York State by far is the gravel underneath the surface. That is the biggest problem we see. This happens to be an old unpaved roadway, it had been unpaved for its entire life. Traffic volume started to get up above that 150 to 200 we talked about last week, where it's probably better to go ahead and pave it, but they didn't clean up the gravel. And so we saw this last week, and this has about a 13% fines content. And so it holds moisture and it failed. It's not a chip seal problem. You could put the best chip seal in the world on it. But if it's got too much moisture in the base, that moisture builds up, it blows it apart. It's too soft when there's a lot of moisture available in the spring. It's a bit of a side hill. And it's going to pop out in the roadway. Does anybody who was on the session last week remember? What I'd like to see is a maximum percentage for the fines content. 
Anybody remember that from last week? Let's see if anybody remembers. 8%, very good. Gold star for Todd. Yeah, and 5% would be even preferred, but yeah, 8% maximum. So, you know, getting the wrong material is an issue for us. <laughs> Maybe even more critical is it doesn't meet the spec. And did you even spec something? That's one of my reasons why I have a pet peeve against item four gravel, because I don't know what the spec is. It hasn't been a state spec since 1972. And so if you ask for item four, what are you getting? I mean, I actually saw a gravel company advertisement that talked about item four and item four New York to state DOT spec. I'm like, what? <laughs> what is the spec? But if you have a spec, make sure it's meeting that specification and that you install it correctly, okay? That's all very important. Now, you may hear things about incompatibility. Uh, probably the most famous or infamous, of course, is when they did aluminum wiring. Aluminum and copper don't really like each other and can create fires. In the world of pavements, you'll sometimes see incompatibility used as an excuse for failures. Most of the time, it's usually something else. And then, of course, maintenance is the fourth thing. Do we do the right maintenance? Uh, did we design it properly? Did we construct it properly? And did we use the right materials? Okay. So when you think about premature failure, it's usually one of these four items, design, construction, materials, and maintenance. But of course, before we take our break, I can't let you go. Someone's already brought it up, but I wanna make sure we don't forget about the fact that, you know, it's pretty important. Um, we got to talk about drainage because drainage is such a critical thing to deal with. Um, this is a picture from a gentleman by the name of Jay Olson. We can show it just giving him credit. So, Michelle, you had it right. We got to take care of the drainage. Uh, the caption on the picture says drainage is critical for roadway design. Ducts are an indicator of poor drainage. Absolutely true. We've got to deal with the drainage. Excess moisture is our enemy. Moisture is not but excess moisture is, okay? So what we're gonna be doing now, um, it's uh, now 9.29, within a few seconds of 9.29. So we're gonna get ready to take our first break, okay? Before I do, I just wanna remind you, open up the chat pod and you can get yourself the handout. And I'm just gonna bring the handout up real quick. The handout has in it the agenda, but more importantly, on page two, it's got some links to some of the tools that we're going to be using to a, a folder where you can, well, actually it's a website that links you to a folder where you can download the tool we'll talk about and also download uh, some of the spreadsheets and other things and this handout, of course, itself. So go to the chat pod, get the updated handout, and we're going to be going ahead and taking our break. And let's make sure I write down this number. And let's see how good my thing here. There we go. And I got it right. So we're going to take our first break, 15 minutes. We'll see everybody at 945. And we're going to be talking about the next step on our journey on low volume road pavement design thickness. See you in 15 minutes.
will be starting up in about five minutes. We'll be starting up in about two minutes. Okay, it's a uh, quarter off. We're going to go ahead and get ourselves started up again. Uh, before I go into the inputs for pavement design, I just want to remind you, if you haven't downloaded the handout, uh, it's in the chat pod. 
And in this handout, it not only has the agenda and some resources you might find, though I've got one resource I realized I didn't put in, I'll put it into the chat pod for you later here. Um, but it will have some place for notes and then has some sheets that talk about some of the tools we're gonna talk about, including the pavement design tool we developed and some of the strange criteria that we talked about in the first hour and some materials, properties, and other stuff that we're gonna be talking about as we talk about the inputs, including some of the other design methods that are out there, such as ASHTO 93 and the New York State DOT Comprehensive Pavement Design Manual. And it's not the whole manual by any stretch, but it is the more salient points and in some of the sheets that you might be using if you use the tool we developed, okay? So we'll come back to that. Let me get back to the page I wanna be on. There we go. And we'll go back to the first slide here for the hour. So for this hour, we're gonna be talking about inputs for low volume pavement design. Truth be told, I could really call this just inputs for pavement design. But as we go through and talk about this, I wanna sort of think about what makes a low volume road different. And just to warn you, I will be asking for your thoughts about this in the last hour, okay? So let's talk about the inputs for pavement design and a little bit on pavement design techniques. But before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, history. Most of our roads were not designed, they evolved. They may have been designed at some point, but very rarely do they stay that way. So we did a research project over two phases with New York State DOT, and a lot of the data in this pavement design tool comes from the work we did there. And to do this, we tested eight locations around the state, ranging from uh, down in Westchester County all the way up into uh, the middle of the Adirondacks up near Oswegatchie, Cranberry Lake area, coldest spot of the state. And we were trying to find a spot over in Jefferson County, because it's one of the places that has a non-silty subgrade. There's not much of that in the state. And so we're looking for a site, and this happens to be up uh, New York State 180 up in Lafargeville, okay? Now, by the definition we're gonna be talking about today, and we talked about last week, this is actually, even though it's a state highway, it is a low volume road. It's 800 AADT, or about two cars a minute in the morning rush. Okay, so it's not a high volume by anybody's definition. Um, so, you know, just knowing that, if you were gonna rebuild a roadway with about 800 vehicles a day, uh, how thick, and it's a pretty good looking road, a few, you know, transverse cracks you can see up through there. How thick are the asphalt and the gravel layers, do you think? So in the Q&A put in there, how thick do you think the asphalt and gravel layers? How thick would you think they'd need to be for just a typical road? There's no industry, there's no extra special heavy loads that I'm aware of, um, and it's 800 vehicles a day, how thick? Okay, let's just see what y'all think, put an answer in. Again, I did not put this as a poll everywhere. I just put this in the, just put this in the Q&A for me. Uh, 24 inches total, okay, yeah, that's a possibility, you know. 12 inches of uh, gravel, three inches of binder, two inches of top, okay. Six inches of asphalt, 18 inches of gravel, five inches of asphalt, 12 inches of gravel. Somebody else says a total of 12 inches. Uh, two and a half inch top, six inch base, 12 inches of gravel, okay. Large variation in what's going on. We can design for the loads that are on it. But again, most roads weren't designed. They may have been initially, but they evolved over time. We actually went out, we did cores, and we did some really big cores, 12 inch diameter cores. And every time I show this picture, I do gotta give, I have to give credit to the folks with the Geotech Bureau at DOT. They made a 12 inch core, it's pretty cool. That they bought, but they also did one for the gravel portion because we wanted big gravel samples and uh, they were successful. But 12 inches wide gives us a nice core, but look at the asphalt. The asphalt alone was 17 and a half inches. There's uh, 16 inches here, and then the last overlay didn't have a tack coat, so it didn't stay stuck when we did the core. 17 and a half inches of just asphalt. 
Um, typically, the state's going to put a minimum of 12 to 18 inches of granular material, sub-base gravel, type 304. Um, and sometimes they box out even more than that. So you're talking a minimum on most state highways uh, of two feet. And in this particular case, it was over a foot of asphalt alone. Uh, probably not really needed from a structural standpoint, but just, again, over time, we just overlay, overlay, overlay. And that may or may not be the right answer. So before we get into what we should be doing, let's talk about how we can design pavements. And there really are four primary techniques. There's experience, which, well, let's be honest, it is the most common technique by far, experience-based. We do what we've always done. You can develop a catalog, and this is actually a pretty good technique for a small agency. Uh, you develop a catalog for given traffic conditions. Just know there's two things. There may be times when you're outside that catalog, so you need to go design specifically. Maybe you've got an industrial park or some extra traffic. And understand the limitations of the catalog and that you may be under or over designing in some cases. You could use an empirical technique, purely empirical base based on data that's been collected, and we'll talk about the most common one, the AASHTO 93 guide, or AASHTO pavement design. And then you could use this newer technique we call mechanistic empirical. The idea is you use the science and engineering, in this case, strain-based science, along with just testing that's been done and history that's been collected, the empirical side of the house, or mechanistic empirical. There are people who'd love us to go completely mechanistic, but there's so much real world variation. This data is stochastic, yeah, engineering work uh, in nature. I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. So, mechanistic empirical is probably going to stay with us for a long, long time. But the more mechanistic we can pull in, the better off we're going to be. So, let's talk about these four techniques and we'll see which ones you've used here at the end of this. Uh, as I say, the most common technique we see by far is experience-based. We go out, we look at the pavement, we say, okay, I need to box this area out here, up right in this area, I need to box out up here, and then the rest of it's just going to be an overlay. <laughs> and that experience-based technique, if you're at a place long enough, turns out to not actually be bad, but it takes a long time to get that experience and may or may not be the most efficient in terms of use of our limited resources and tends to either cause us to under or over design because we don't really understand what the loads are or what's going on underneath, okay? You could develop a catalog uh, and this is in uh, the comprehensive design, pavement design guide from the state DOT. Uh, this is their older table um, the conventional pavement design, the older one they had back before the 90s, literally was a single table for the entire state. And you really only needed to know, if you look carefully, you'll see, you only needed to know three things. You needed to know the daily traffic, okay? You needed to know the percentage of trucks, and you had to decide uh, whether or not you were going to have an asphalt surface, black, or a Portland cement surface, white. And if you knew those things, you could go in and you could design your pavement. It's a catalog. It's a very simple catalog, and for the entire state, probably not enough variation. Because if you look, low volume roads, almost all low volume roads, would fall in to this one category right here, down the bottom row. So essentially, every low volume road would have the same design. You don't use concrete on the low volume roads according to this table. You don't care about the percentage of trucks. And as we'll see, that can make a huge difference. So essentially, you put in 300 millimeters or 12 inches of sub-base course and that's important, that's a sub-base course, which has an allowable fines content of 10%. You put in 75 millimeters, i.e. three inches of base course, okay? And you put in top and binder combined of 80 millimeters, 
or three and a quarter. Though I'll be honest with you, I can't know of a contractor who's really going to want to pay three and a quarter inches. So you're probably either going to get three inches or three and a half inches. That's one design. So all low volume roads would be designed by going 12 inches of gravel covered by three inches of a base covered by probably going to wind up with three and a half inches of a top. Um, in a lot of cases that might be, you know, that's a, maybe that's your minimums and you say, well, that's the minimum I want to pave anyway. But in a lot of cases that may actually be too thick. In a lot of cases it might be too thin. Okay. But that's a catalog base and there's a, they've updated their catalog. They still use a catalog system, but it's got a lot more sophistication to it. We'll talk about that. You could use empirical techniques. And the most famous, of course, is Ashto. And it was first developed, by the way, it was Asho. So I'd get rid of the T here. And it was actually back into the 50s and 60s when they did the testing. So Asho, the Asho road test was done in a place called Ottawa, Ottawa Illinois. And I realized I forgot to move my picture up. I apologize. But this picture was taken on the interstate uh, that's there now. You can actually drive on the interstate by Ottawa, Illinois, and you'll actually find remnants of this old testing ground. And they had army privates driving around in trucks, testing pavement, and they came up with this long equation. Okay. And this long equation had in it a whole bunch of different factors. Okay. So we're going to walk from left to right down this equation, and we'll talk about what do these things mean. Now, W18. Okay, and actually I need to let me get a different color here. The yellow is just not going to show. Let's try. Let's try the dark green if that's that'll be different enough, but it won't be from the black. Yeah, that's good. W18. W18. That's those uh, number of axle loads. Remember we talked about the ESOL the equivalent single axle load, you convert everything to an equivalent single axle load of 18 kips or nine tons. Okay, and you, that's the end of the equation. How many trips can you take? That's that N sub F cycle that you can think about that we'd use in that SN curve. You've got these two numbers here. Originally, there was only one number there. There's statistical variations that exist. Uh, essentially, Z is an old statistical term of normal equation. And S is how much reliability do you expect to have in the whole system? Okay. Uh, state has some defined numbers that they typically use, and they're probably pretty good for New York State. So, it's a, you know, if you're using AASHTO, I'd go find the Comprehensive Pavement Design Guide and use their numbers. And they're pretty good. Uh, again, uh, an empirical number. Multiplier is just an exponential multiplier. Again, we're in this world of the log log space. Okay. Okay. This Sn was something called a structural number, where essentially each layer accounted for its structure based on the thickness. So asphalt might have a equivalent thickness of 0.44. So every inch of asphalt gave you a 0.44 towards your structural number. Okay, and if you really think about it, that's actually the output you really cared about was the structural number. Uh, something called delta PSI. Delta PSI is an interesting one. Essentially, it's the difference between the day you built it and the day the road was redone in a scale of zero to five. Okay, so it's called the serviceability index and P is the present serviceability index, okay, or pavement serviceability index. I'll see people write down in there, but PSI, serviceability, how smooth is the road? How badly cracked is it? A form of the same things we talked about in the first hour. On a scale of zero to five, what do you think a road starts at on a scale of zero to five? In the Q&A, what, you know, what would be the beginning number for the serviceability of the pavement the day you built it? What do you think? What would be my PSI? Five? 
we'd love to see five. <laughs> if you build a road perfectly, it would be five. Truth be told, in a lot of cases, a lot of agencies go, you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to be conservative and we're going to assume the pavement starts at a little lower, maybe 4.75 or even 4.5 in some cases. But here's the more critical one. We could live with five. We could probably make that work. What is the serviceability at the end of the life of the pavement? How much deterioration are we going to allow? Do we want to let that pavement go all the way down to zero? You know, if you looked at that from a curve standpoint, you'd have a curve over here. And this would be the PSI here, the present serviceability index. And let's say it starts at five. So that's our five up here. And over time, it's going to deteriorate. And what happens with pavements is they slowly, they come out, whoop, held too long. They come down and they start to deteriorate. They deteriorate quickly. And then they sort of flatten out when they get really, really bad. <laughs> You'll have seen this in a lot of other stuff we talk about with asset management and pavement design. So if it starts at five, where do we want to cut it off and say, I don't want that road to get any worse than this. In other words, what's failure? What's my cutoff point? So what would be your acceptable value for the delta in this particular case? How much present serviceability are you willing to give up? Do you want to go to zero? I hope not. So we'd have to pick a number. And it's the delta, the difference between the two that we debate. Okay, so for a state road, maybe you only want that to be about 2.5 or even 2. For a low volume road, maybe you could live with that delta number being as high as 3. Okay, so the final PSI might be down to 2 or it might be 2.5, depending again on the type of roadway. And for low volume roads, we're allowing it maybe to go a little bit lower. So a few more trips essentially. And more equations, more equations. N sub r, that's an interesting one. That's the last item in our list. And the M sub r essentially is, what is the subgrade giving us in terms of strength? Okay, how much support does the subgrade give? That's the subgrade support modulus. Okay, M sub r. Okay. Now, this is all done these days with computers. But back when all this was developed, was things were done with slide rules. <laughs> and they developed nomographs. And you probably all remember nomographs. But uh, this is, well, like it or not, this is what we use these days. We use nomographs. And I've given you in the handout, if you go in there, you can actually see, you'll get a copy of it, the actual nomograph and the equation itself, OK? And it's, a, it's actually pretty cool. They actually have whole classes on it. I've kept a couple of books that uh, Lynn Irwin had on how to develop nomographs. And there were classes in college on how to develop a nomograph. So you didn't have to do a slide rule for every single step of the equation. You can imagine that would take quite a bit of time uh, to do with an equation as complicated as this one right here, OK? So. What you would do is you'd come in here. You'd start with your R value, your reliability. Remember, we talked about these statistical things uh, that would start there. Okay. You then come to a, what's called a turning line because you want to fit on a single piece of paper. You have to turn it. That's an interesting technique on that. You would come up through the number of axle loads. That's this is this is W. Okay. So this is our. Uh, R and Z and S values over here. You go to another turning line. Otherwise, you'd have this really long line going way up in the distance. Come down to here to the subgrade support, M sub R. OK. And then you come over to this table. And this is the design serviceability of life, delta PSI. You come straight across, hit this design allowable serviceability loss and you get your structural number. So what they've essentially done is developed a nomograph to solve for S sub n, OK? Because if you think about it, that's what you really need. What you really need is something to calculate the thickness of the pavement, OK? So I'm going to come back here and get my pen color changed again.
And so you can imagine if you did this equation, and we'll actually use the one that they give in the example inside of Ashto, and they get a solution of S sub n of equal to 5.0, okay? So 5.0 S sub n. And the way the Ashto method works is for each layer in your pavement, you have a structural number, and you multiply that times the number, in this case is inches, and you get the structural number for your particular pavement. And typically for asphalt, we'd use a structural coefficient of around 0.44 plus or minus. Okay, now it's an older pavement, it's broken up a little bit. So let's just look at that Lafarge pavement. And yeah, this Lafarge pavement has a lot less traffic than the one they show here. This, this particular thing is five point uh, times 10 to the sixth e-cells. Um, that's a lot of e-cells, that's five million e-cells. And truth be told, Lafarge, if you do the math, would be closer to, over the life of the pavement, closer to a, less than a million. But we'll just do that for the sake of argument. Lafarge pavement, does anybody remember how thick that was? Let's see if I can remember how thick that was. So I'll pull up my calculator. 17.5, okay, very good. So I've got 17.5 times my structural number, okay? So I go to my calculator and I go 17.5 times 0.44, I get 7.7. .7. Theoretically, if this is uh, the way it would work is you would get 7.7 .7 structural number just because of the asphalt, okay? <laughs> it's probably a little bit of overkill. Okay, so you probably don't need that much asphalt on a lower volume roadway. You certainly don't need it if the structural number is only about five. And most low volume roads, the structural numbers tend to be much smaller. And we'll talk about lifespan and stuff like that later on when we get into that. But that's the idea behind an empirical system. You develop an equation based upon actual testing and you develop a model. Okay, and then you can design your pavement that way. And the nice thing about it is it's, it's spreadsheet enabled. You can do it pretty quickly. Um, do you see anything about this technique that makes you nervous? Anything in here that, you know, if you've played with this tool, anything you concern here? I'll let you think about that one. We'll come back to that in a bit. In the con Comprehensive Pavement Design Manual from NISDOT, the new one, the current version. You still have similar choices. You still do black or white asphalt or Portland cement concrete surface. But rather than just looking at traffic, you actually look at that subgrade, that subgrade resilient modulus M sub R, the same M sub R that's in the Ashto equation. The current design for state roads when they're reconstructing them, they assume 50 year design life, okay? So if you actually look in the stuff we've given you in the handout, you'll get a chart and a graph that looks like this. And you can go onto the chart and pull out the thickness that you need based upon the number of easels. And there's a simplified technique for counting the number of easels that are available, okay? And so in this particular case, uh, we're gonna assume sort of, uh, and let me go back up here. One slide, there we go. There's a range of subgrade moduli. Now these are listed in megapascals and you're going, how do I convert from megapascals? There's again, tools available to do that. I'm not too worried about that. Really what you wanna think about this an easier way to think about it is we go from 28, i.e. soft clay type material and uh, you know the kind of things that you might find up in Fort Edward or up along Jefferson County, or you've got a poor drainage situation, you're along a valley or a road, all the way up to 62 megapascals, i.e. you're really pretty good structure underneath, well-drained, might even be rock fairly close to the surface, and you got a you know, really strong surface. And so in that particular case, all you got to do is find that, calculate your number of easels, for most low volume roads, it's gonna be under 2 million. 
okay? Three million at the upper end of that 2,000 per day. Um, and I'll show you a way we can look at that here in a little while. But the idea is you can just pull this out and you get your thickness. If you use the NYSDOT catalog, just be aware of something. Let me pull up one that's sort of in the middle of the road and a little conservative towards the end, 41 megapascal. So, it's this, so if you look at the list, it's sort of the one right here, a little below the middle, okay? If you knew nothing else, you could quickly just pick this one up and get going. So we'll look at this and we'll look at the low end. Uh, again, six million easels, 165 millimeters. How many inches is that? 165 millimeters? Anybody want to know, tell me how many inches that is? Six and a half inches, yep, okay. So that's a six and a half inch pavement. Um, the thing they call select subgrade thickness, that's where they box out a section. So they just spread the load on the subgrade a little bit more. You don't need to box out the section on a low volume road, but you're not gonna put just six and a half inches of asphalt because if you actually look carefully in here, there's also an additional permeable base layer of four inches and a sub base layer of 12 inches, okay? So if you come in here and you actually look at the pavement, you have just to use this table carefully, okay? So yeah, you have six and a half inches of surface, but then you're gonna have four inches of a permeable base, 12 inches of gravel over the top of whatever you've got there, okay? So this particular case, you're gonna have 10 and a half inches of asphalt because the permeable base is an asphalt bound material with an open grade and 12 inches of asphalt, okay? So just be aware of that. Make sure you look at the table itself. That thickness is just the top surface asphalt and doesn't talk about the sub base layer, okay? But it's a good technique and you could use it and get you in the ballpark. And it's a good way to sort of see, am I close to this when I do my actual pavement design? It's a nice check of nothing else when you actually do a design, okay? And then the final technique is this new, more modern thing called mechanistic empirical. It's a strain-based fatigue failure criterion where we look at the amount of bending, the amount of strain, and the amount of failure. And again, the most common ones we look at are the tension in the asphalt and the vertical or rutting failure on the subgrade. But the reality is you might even wanna look at uh, what's going on here in the middle of the uh, base layer, that could make a big difference. Any unbound layers. You might look at top-down cracking due to wheel rutting. You might look at long-term stability of the asphalt, things like that. And this is all done in the uh, modern Ashto Darwin ME kind of stuff. Um, works pretty well. And if you're wondering, by the way, for those who care, there's other techniques out there. There's more than one. So I'm just gonna show you one after the, this hour, but don't feel like you're bound to it. What I really care about is you design the pavement to handle the loads. To me, that's the most important thing. So you could use Ashto, though it's not cheap per seat, though I know state DOT does have some licenses. I don't know how many. I see there's somebody here from the state. I don't know if you know how many licenses the state's got for Ashto, but there are other ones out there. For instance, if you want to do a concrete pavement, the uh, concrete pavement people, ACI and, uh, the Concrete Pavers Association. Uh, they've got one called pavementdesigner.org. Um, and I'll actually put it into the chat panel so you can actually see it there. You can actually go online and you can actually design a pavement that's concrete if you care about that for low volume roads. Um, but make sure if you use a tool, you understand all the nuances with it. Um, I played around with it and it works pretty well but there are some things you need to know, some jargon and some certain numbers you need to be aware of. And if you don't know those numbers, go get some help. Don't be sure, okay? So let me just ask, because I care, and this will help us in our last hour and a half together. Again, back to Poll EV, or if you don't have Poll EV, you could do it in the Q&A. Uh, 
which of these tools have you used? And you should be able to put in more than one. I'm, I'm hoping I got that working. I never know. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's just see. I'm guessing, uh, can't quite tell if it's letting you put in more than one. It almost looks like it's not. I apologize for that then. Every time I put one of these in, I guess, and then sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. Yeah, it looks like, well, somebody here put A and B. Yeah, okay. By far the most common is experience, by the way, when we've done this. Um, a catalog, very common for local roads. Very, very common. Almost everybody has done that at some point in their life. They've done, they've done some kind of thing like that. So keep that in mind. Um, and developing a catalog is not a bad technique. You may even want to think about doing that even after you use some of these other techniques. What the state is doing makes a lot of sense to develop a catalog. The question always is, what is the range where the catalog is good? And is it applicable for your agency? You know, one catalog for the state or do they need a little more nuance? Or are there ranges where, eh, you're outside that range. You'll need to use something more nuanced. And we think that's true for low volume roads. When you get down low volume roads, a small thickness can make a huge difference, okay? And nobody here has done mechanistic empirical. We're fans of it, but it does take some time to use, but that's where we developed a tool that hopefully you'll appreciate and you can try using it yourself. Okay, and that helps me quite a bit. So what I wanna do is I wanna spend our next half hour together talking about mechanistic empirical pavement design. Even though you may not think so, the Ashto design method, the one that you're more commonly familiar with because you've used empirical or you're at least now familiar with it, actually uses mechanistic methods behind it. If you look at the underlying math, they just never really thought about it that way until they started really looking at it in the 1990s. And so this technique does work and it goes back to this same concept of the critical fatigue. And the idea is you pick the failure criterion you care about, that's the mechanistic side. And then once you've selected that failure mode and criterion, you develop what the failure criterion is, usually using testing. That's the empirical side of the house. And then you take those together and you develop a failure model, okay? So essentially you're developing an equation, not that different than the Ashto equation. The difference is you're using a more mechanistic approach, a more engineering-based approach to actually calculate these stresses and strains using testing that you've done, okay? So how do we do that in a pavement? How do we know what the mechanistic parts are? What we need to know is the strains at critical locations, okay? The way we do that is we use something called elastic layer theory, okay? And we have to do a forward calculation. So if we know the pavement thickness and we know the stiffness of the layers and we know something called the Poisson's ratio, which is how much it moves when you push on it, we can calculate the stresses, the strains, and displacement at any place in a pavement, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get into all the science behind it. We don't have the time to do that, but it actually goes back to the 1800s for single layer and eventually got to multi-layered systems with computers. And that's where the Chevron Chevrolet program and the Shell Oil Company had programs. And they started developing things with computers. And until the 1970s, the computers were slow and big and they took a lot of time. To do the calculations I showed you earlier with that spreadsheet tool, um, the, the interface with the Excel adds more time than it takes to actually do the calculations. The calculations themselves are in the microseconds these days with modern computers. But back in the 70s, when you do these same calculations, it would take you minutes to run a single calculation. So computer speed has made this feasible and doable. And the idea is you just need to know your structure. And if you know the traffic and the structure, i.e. the load, the wheel area, you can calculate the stresses and strains at any location in the pavement. Now, there are nonlinear systems and all that, but for low volume, we don't need to know that, okay? 
So you need to know these things. Now in a truck, do we know the load? Well, we can approximate the load. Do we know the area of the tire on the surface? No, we don't. So we have to have something instead of the area. That's the thing we talk about and all the calculations use that. But the reality is we can also know, and this is one of the reasons I don't typically put it on there, we can know a little p called pressure, okay? And that we do know. We know the pressure in the tire. What's the pressure in a modern truck tire? What's the pressure? What's the pressure in PSI? Hmm. People are going out to the trucks now and they're looking on the wheel. They're going, Man, what's it say? Your car tire, by the way, is around 30 to 40 PSI, okay? 35 being real common, though there are some tires around actually in the 20s, depending on the design. But most modern truck tires are much closer to 100 to 150 PSI in that range. So high pressure. We'll come back to why that's important later on. So you need to know the pressure in the tires for the truck. That does actually make a big difference in the design. Now we're making an assumption about the pavement, which may or may not be realistic. We're assuming that the layers are uniform. We know that's not always true. We assume that they don't change with depth. That's not completely true. So we're making a lot of assumptions. But for a low volume road, for a simple pavement, it actually turns out to work pretty darn well. We don't have to go that crazy. So we're gonna look at a particular pavement, a simple pavement, again, this is a little thicker than most low volume roads would need to be, but let's go back to our calculation that we just did. We calculated it at about 7.7 .7 inches of asphalt needed. We're gonna round it up because that's how you do that in the real world, you round up to eight inches, 12 inches of sub base. And we're gonna assume the top part of the subgrade behaves a little different than the lower subgrade because it's affected by freezing and thawing. And that's actually a very common thing you should be doing any, anywhere in the frost parts of the world, which is, i.e., most of New York. So in that particular case, we just need to know the calculation of the stresses and strains. We need to pick the stiffness of the layers. And you're going, well, how do I know that? Well, I got good news for you. You don't have to memorize these things in your handout. Okay. And nope, my computer decided to not go all the way. There we go. One of the things we gave you is a typical value sheet, okay? So about page nine in the handout is a list of typical values of the stiffness of the various layers. So for asphalt concrete that's uncracked, uh, it could be anywhere from as high as 5 million in the middle of the winter down to uh, Literally on a really hot day, it can be really soft. Asphalt concrete can get down under 100,000 PSI, it's that soft. That's part of the reason we use super pave because it actually flattens out that difference. And we can actually usually use numbers closer to 100,000 PSI in the hot part of the summer with a well-designed asphalt surface, but it does make a difference. But you, can, you don't have to memorize these things, so don't, don't go crazy about that, okay? Now, the reason I said the pressure in the tires matters, okay, this is a complicated chart. And so I, I'm gonna try to explain it to you, but I, I'm gonna point out the most critical things here in just a minute, okay? What this shows you is for that typical pavement, the critical stresses underneath the wheel. And let's see, I'm gonna use blue, I think this time. Um, so essentially what it shows you is for a 9,000 pound wheel load, a 4,500 pound wheel load, in other words, half of an easel or half, you know, a truck that's mostly empty. And the pressure in the tires is in 50 PSI or 100 PSI. So we essentially have four different lines on here. We have a 9,000 pound or a nine kip load. Okay. And we have a 4.5 kip load. 
And then we have pressure in the tires of 50 PSI and 100 PSI. We look at all four of those combinations, okay? Deep down, when you get down into the subgrade layers, those lines are right on top of each other. They're really hard to see that there's any difference. So once you get down into the subgrade, the only thing that you really have to worry about from the standpoint of the rutting problem that we talked about is the weight. Weight drives everything. So the line that's 4,500 is over here. The line that's 9,000 is over here. Just what you'd expect, it's just about doubled even with all the different wheels. And yeah, this is an analysis looking at all 10 wheels in the dump truck, okay? But as you're at the surface, at the very surface of the pavement, it doesn't matter what the weight is. It turns out it's the pressure in the tires that really matters at the surface. And if you remember the term sock hop, that's where that comes from. It's the same concept. You can have somebody who only weighs 105 pounds soaking wet, but if they're on a high-heeled shoe, they step on a wooden surface, they can actually cause damage to it. So that's why you spread the loads out. So high-pressure tires create a higher surface problem. That can lead to a form of rubbing in the surface, an unstable mix. But what that really says to us is we need to design our mixes to handle that. That's why we use super pave. That's why we use stone matrix asphalt, rut avoidance mixes. It's a mix design problem more than it is a structural design problem. But I just want you to keep that in mind because the 4,500 and the 9,000 pound wheel loads actually have the same stre stress. And by the way, strain as well right at the very surface due to this issue of high pressure tires, okay? So the higher the pressure of the tire, the more you have to be aware of that particular problem, okay? Now, if we go back to, uh, yes, uh, a good point. Steel wheeled buggies, Amish horses, or any horses with steel can actually create a high pressure situation, okay? So that's why you have to be very careful of it. How do you deal with the shoes? It turns out their load spread pretty quickly. Most of that damage is relatively shallow. So make sure you're using a really good uniform surface mix, okay? And you may have where they cross the roadway in large numbers, you may have to do sand patches now and then. That actually works amazingly well. But the bigger issue is when they get off the paved sections onto gravel, they can go in pretty deep because of high pressure on the rubber, uh, not rubber, the steel, wheels or the uh, steel shoes, okay? And the long spikes, yeah, I've seen where these are spikes. Uh, we actually try to get them not to do that. Uh, when I was with Yates County, there was a lot of Mennonites and they uh, certainly had some issues there to deal with. And design mixes, again, I would use the stone matrix asphalt for the asphalt layers and make sure you guys really, make sure you get strong stone. You may want a stiffer stone for your uh, chip seals. You're lucky where you are, Tim, you're up. And by the way, you're wondering, he's sending me some notes in the question and answer about uh, Amish. I apologize. I should have repeated that. Um, when you get large buggies and stuff like that, that cause high pressure. But realize that you may want to be using a granitic type stone that's a little stiffer, a little able to handle that. And luckily, you are in the Adirondacks. So you have some capability to get those stronger stones. Okay. So if we look at the asphalt strain that we've got here, okay, that we're dealing with, okay, um, and this is the line we've seen. Again, when you do all these calculations, you get your stresses and your strains, you're gonna calculate a micro strain, a very, very small strain, but it still adds up over time. And you're gonna come across with a vertical horizontal line until you hit the failure criterion. And then you're gonna come down until you hit some number of reputations in sub F. And the way this mechanistic system works is it uses something called miner's hypothesis. No, we're not talking about uh, the seven dwarfs and mining. No, it's a gentleman named miner. And the idea behind this is for every single configuration of your whatever you're dealing with, it could be a metal bar or it could be a pavement, you can calculate the number of cycles to failure, this value in sub F 
big N sub F. Okay, but for an actual real world situation, there's an actual number of cycles that you have to deal with. Okay, and that actual number of cycles is little n sub f. So the actual number of cycles over the allowable number of cycles. Okay, and you can calculate a fraction. And that fraction is known as the D factor or damage factor, okay? It is essentially the amount of damage in your structure, whether it's a pavement or a metal bar. And that's a percentage. And so therefore what you can do is for a given configuration, you can calculate the amount of damage. So if we go back to our sample pavement and we calculate an ESAW load, and you could do this for any load configuration, you can calculate the number of cycles allowable, 9.42 million in this the pavement we've been looking at. And if we go and we calculate out how many cycles is that for a road with 5,000 vehicles a day, just, just pick the random number. No, not really, but let's assume 5,000 vehicles a day. You can actually calculate over the 50 or life of pavement or 25 or whatever, the number of cycles to failure. In this case, I use 25 years. And that adds up to about 4.71 million for little n sub f. Okay, so I just have to take a ratio. Well, because I chose these numbers on purpose, if my little n sub f is 4.7 million and my big N is 9.4 million, the ratio of those two is 50 percent. So what that says is that particular load configuration has caused half of the allowable damage available to me. So in our paperclip model, if I was bending and I could have 20 cycles, if I bend it, say 90 degrees allows 20 cycles and I bend it 10 cycles, I've lost half the life of that pavement. And then I have to just look at the other configurations that exist. So going back to our asphalt line, okay, the question is, what will the pavement look like? How do we define it? You know, for a bridge, it's pretty easy. Bridge broken, okay, we got a problem. But what will the pavement look like after N sub F load repetitions? Okay, and that's actually one of the debates, and there's a lot of debate about there about what that looks like, okay? It does not look like this. That's well beyond what anybody would agree is a design failure, too many cracks. This is more common, okay? A design failure where we see about 20% of the surface, 25%, there's debates about that, as cracked, okay? A certain percentage of the surface is cracked. That's a failure in the cracking world, okay? And we could debate what that number is, and you can actually get away with maybe a little bit more in a low volume road. When it comes to subgrade, by the way, what will the pavement look like? We care about rutting. That translates into the surface, not rutting in the surface asphalt. This is an asphalt mix problem. This is not a design problem in this case on an interstate. It looks more like this. You're seeing wide ruts that are deep down into the subgrade. A good way to think about what it would look like is when the rut gets enough to where it channels the water, that's probably a failure. And that's a pretty good criterion, about half inch rutting uh, is what we typically allow because now we're holding water, excess water, premature failure. So if that's our definition and we've gone back to our equations, okay, for the subgrade and the surface, um, we can actually calculate the ratio like we did earlier and it's that fourth power equation that we talked about. So loads matter. Okay, that's just what I want you to deal with. So how do you deal with mixed traffic? I mean, that's a challenge because in the old empirical system, we convert every single vehicle to an ESAL. And we do that using an equation, which by the way, had a very close ratio to a slope of four in our log log space. It's same equation shows back up again and again and again, but how do you deal with mixed traffic? Now, you may or may not have seen this. This is in your handout if you're interested. 
the FHWA defines 13 classes of vehicles, okay? There's actually a 14th that's not shown, but for pavements, we're gonna use 13 classes of vehicles. Motorcycles all the way up to seven or more axle multi-trailer systems, okay? So how do you deal with all of those different vehicles? I mean, wow, could go crazy. Well, computers make this feasible, make this possible. And the way you do this is you go back to Miner's hypothesis and you calculate big N and little n, the amount of damage for every single configuration, okay? So we'll look at load level one, we might get a certain amount of strain and we come across to our failure line, we come down to the cycles to failure, number of allowable cycles. And we do the same thing for load level two. And for each different configuration, we calculate a little n over a big n and we add them up. And as long as that total number is less than one, the pavement should be fine, okay? And it's amazingly effective. It works really, really well, okay? The big challenge, of course, is how many different configurations do we have to deal with when it comes to big D or little n over big N, okay? So what are the factors that you might have to deal with? What changes in a pavement? So again, I'm not gonna throw this into a poll, just in the Q and A, give me a couple of examples of things that you'd have to worry about that change in a pavement that might change the number of allowable cycles, the big N, and even the little N, the number of actual repetitions of pavement. What, what do I have to worry about? What do I have to worry about here? The size of the aggregate, the mix, the mixture you're dealing with, uh, possibly, especially on the surface, maybe. But from a design standpoint, probably the stiffness of the layer that we care about. And that stiffness changes over time, OK? You know, the asphalt mix, how stiff is? Is there cold mix versus a hot mix? That's going to be very different. So that's going to change the number of cycles to failure. Uh, the number of seasons we have to deal with. The variation in the trucks you might have to deal with. There's a huge list, and we'll go through that list after our br second break here. But essentially, that's how Miner's hypothesis works. And the computer makes it feasible as long as we can define what those variations are in traffic and season and weather, what's going on in the subgrade. We can actually calculate the number of cycles of allowable over the number are under the number of cycles actual and add them up. And as long as D is under one, we're happy, okay? So that's the concept behind mechanistic empirical. And of course, the challenge is you not only have to deal with the variations in traffic, but you actually have to deal with the variations in the pavement layer because they change seasonally. And I'll show you that in just a second. Hopefully we've got pretty good thickness consistency, okay? But seasonality can make a difference. You know, annually there's seasons, spring, summer, winter, and fall, but there's heck, there's variations in the day. I mean, this morning I went for my morning walk and it was 47 degrees when I left my house. This afternoon it's supposed to be 83. That's actually gonna affect the asphalt's response. And over time, we know asphalt ages, it cracks, gravel breaks down. So all these factors have to be taken into account, okay? So when we end our second hour together, I just wanna remind you of the need for seasons and talk about the variations here in New York. So in a pavement, again, we're gonna now start looking at more low volume roadways, okay? So we've got a subgrade native material, a granular sub base, and then an asphalt surface and base. Okay, so we're still dealing with a, a state kind of definition here, but three layers. And we'll look at one year from January to December. So, you know, most years, the pavement's completely frozen when we start the year in January. And it may have a thawing period in the, in the middle, but there's gonna be a time when it starts to thaw, okay? 
and the frost is going to go down a certain depth. That's the weather effect. Now, how deep does the frost get in your particular area? How deep down does the frost go? Two feet, yeah, some parts of the state can be more. I'll show you a map in just a second. We gave you one in your handout too. Four feet, uh, you get up into Cranberry Lake, they're averaging more than that. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But you need to account for that weather change because as it freezes, it changes. And as it thaws, it gets really soft. So that weather effect is the subgrade part of it. Yeah. So that thawing period is really critical. It's probably the most critical time for especially low volume roads because they're really weak at that time of year. Okay. Now, once we get past the thawing, there's a rapid drainage that can happen. And most of the water that can drain up by gravity leaves. But if we have poor drainage, we may be trapping water, but the pavement can drain some. And then of course we get a more stable period of time. We're in that right now in the summer, things heat up and warm up. The asphalt gets softer too. So it's a balancing act. And then we repeat the process to start the year over. Okay. Now, It'd be nice if it was just as easy as this, but the real world, of course, doesn't have this nice smooth curves like I show in this little graph here. But you could just look at the uh, lower layers, not the asphalt layer. You can imagine they're very stiff in the summer. They get really weak in spring. I mean, in the winter, they're very stiff. They get weak in the spring thaw. That's their weakest time of year in the spring thaw period here. Okay. And then they get pretty consistent after that. Okay, the lowest layers below the freezing zone, they don't change much at all. Okay, so they're pretty consistent. How many days of fall do we have to worry about? Well, as part of these projects we did with the state, we looked at that. And again, this handout's available to you and we'll use it later on. But you can see the number of days of thaw, which by the way, may occur in January. We know that vary quite a bit. Down Long Island, it might be a week or less of thawing days that you'd have to account for. But you get up into the Adirondacks, into Lewis and St. Lawrence counties, you're talking as many as seven weeks in the year. Okay. And what does this do in terms of pavement design? Well, let's look at a pavement with only seven days of spring thaw. We're going to put a pavement right in the middle of Long Island and assume seven days of spring thaw. And we design it for the number of cycles to failure, allowable of 660,000 for a fairly moderately low volume roadway, maybe 2,000 vehicles a day, okay? You take that same pavement, same subgrade, but just shift it into the Adirondacks. And the number of allowable cycles to failure drops from 660 all the way down to under 500,000, a reduction of over 25%. So it's really important to understand that seasonality as we're doing our design. And you could do that by calculating average annual responses. You could do detailed hourly calculations, or you could look at a representative year. These are the three most common techniques that you'll see. Um, I'm gonna show you why I'm not a fan of the first one at all. If you've got a really good computer, the second one with hourly works really well. That's what the Ashto method uses. And the tool I'm gonna to show you after the break is representative. If you just use the average year, you might miss real world variations. This is freezing that occurred when we were doing the research with DOT, and we just went back and looked. And this is the depth, uh, cumulative degree days of air freezing. And as you can see, and it's correlated very closely to frost depth, by the way, 2000 to 2003, the depth was, you know, number of degree days was over a thousand. It's a cold year. Meanwhile, in 2001, 2002, we barely got above 150. So you can't just use an average. You really need to use something that deals with the real world variation and account for the possible different seasons that you deal with. And it, based on time, I'm not going to go through all this. I'm going to show you a real world. This is data from Spencer, New York. And if you look at it from the standpoint of actual freezing and thawing from 2003 and four, look at the difference. Frost only got into the subgrade a while, but you got asphalt variations, you got freezing and thawing in the sub base, all of these are real world issues. And if you define it by what season it is, you're going to have to have some non consecutive days. And so you can't just use average, you need to use more detailed calculations. That's what we developed, we developed a series of maps that have the number of days of winter 
everything's frozen, number of days of thaw, and you can use that in the pavement design. Okay. Now, I'm a firm believer the mind can absorb what the butt can endure. And while I've got about oh, a few more slides to finish up on this discussion of seasonality, I also know that we need to uh, take advantage of that. So I'm going to type in 88. So I know we've got the right slide number. And I'm going to go ahead and take our second break. Okay. So we're going to start back up at 11 o'clock. And uh, we'll go from there and finish up on low volume pavement design. See you in 15 minutes. Yeah, we should make that. Okay.
We'll be starting back up in about five minutes.
Yes, it's a humorous video, but it does bring up a very important point about wheel wander. And yes, it's fake. So we're going to start back up. And last thing I want to talk about real briefly is uh, wheel wander. OK. And it's, it's an important point. Um, we don't always account for it properly. And it's a very important point. Because if you don't do that, you actually get a, a mistake when you do a mechanistic design. You have to deal with the fact that vehicles don't follow in exactly the same path. Uh, this is actually going to be a problem as we move into the future that people are starting to realize with automated vehicles because they don't tend to wander as much. The normal wheel wander is about 10 inches for most vehicles on uh, moderate you know, roadways, most of the ones we deal with, uh, more on the interstate. But if you get a vehicle that tracks exactly the same, you can actually create running problems and surface problems because the wheels don't wander and the stresses don't change as much, especially in the surface layers where you know, 10 inches of variation is quite a difference in the amount of strain. If you think about the wheel centered around here at this point, the actual highest strain is just off a little bit in a dual axle because you've got two wheels, but 10 inches of wheel wander can make a huge difference in the amount of strain that you have to deal with. So you have to account for wheel wander, especially in the surface. Um, so this is something we need to think about when we're designing the driverless vehicles. Uh, probably not as critical for uh, the subgrade, but it does make a difference even there. So we do have to include wheel wander in our designs. And if you're using a tool that doesn't, you may get a, an asphalt number, especially, that tends to be a lot thicker than you think. And it's not going to help you because the real problem is really the fact that you didn't account for the wheel wander and the pavement fails in a different way than you think. Because if we just look at the strain contributions, you know, it makes a big difference. So let's bring it all together and let's talk about low volume road design. Okay. So when it comes to mechanistic empirical design, uh, we've got to just know all these factors. And if we can get all of these factors, we can actually do a pretty good job of doing the design. And we just need to assess the design somewhat. And the goal at the end is not to hit exactly at one. Okay. General rule of thumb, if you think about it from assessing the design standpoint, if we look at that D value, um, to be conservative, we don't want D to be above one. Uh, we want that, however, to fail first in the surface, as we talked about before. And a, a good rule, most people use a range of 0 0.9 um, for D and less than about 1.05. OK. Let's see if my pen catches up with me. There we go. So generally, we'll let a little bit of extra damage factor occur. But we're trying to aim for close to 1, being a little conservative. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, but that's where something like the MEPDG, the tools that are available, come in handy. A lot of tools out there, as long as you understand the black box behind them. The AASHTO method does work pretty well. Um, if you do get a chance to use it, my advice is take your time, practice, play with it. It should be actually close to what you think. Your brain is pretty good. Um, but deal with that reality. Um, they use a red light, green light, yellow light system within the tool. Um, that allows you to sort of check yourself. And they've modified it some from this old screenshot that I've got of it, where you can actually tell the difference if you're colorblind. They realize you have to do that too, because you need to be able to know that. So they've changed the tone so it looks okay in black and white. But what I want to do, I want to spend our last hour together really focusing on low volume roads, because the Astro Design Tool is a very good tool, but it's really aimed at the higher volume roadways, the interstate system, things like that. So what I want to talk about is low volume road design. And you could use that tool. It's available from the Cement Association. There are some others out there. You can just search for them. But I want to talk about a tool we developed and why we think it's a good tool. More important than anything, though, I want you to understand the limitations that exist 
and when you're developing a low volume design standard, what you might need to think about. Now we developed this with the, uh, as I said earlier, the University Transportation Center. There's no R. I don't know why USD is, he doesn't put an R in there because it really is a research center. It's actually based out of Rutgers. We're a member of that. Um, and so the idea behind this is to develop a low volume pavement design tool. Now you're probably going to do, when I show you this, you're going to be going, I can't read this. Uh, this is the spreadsheet tool. There's a copy of it in your handout. Don't try to read it, okay? Go to the handout, go to the website. You can download and try this tool out at your leisure. If you have any questions, please tell me because we don't think this tool is final. There's always room for improvement. We may need to modify that fatigue factor. We may need to put in other traffic patterns. We want this tool to be useful for those trying to design the roads to get them as close as they can to handle the loads that are on them. To do a pavement design, whether it's a low volume design, high volume, it doesn't really matter. The, there's an evaluation of the existing pavement that's done first. Okay, that's actually a very important step. A lot of people wonder, you know, why is the first thing we do check the existing pavement? That's absolutely critical. Okay, then and only then can you run a design of your pavement. And then any tool you're using should have the capability to tweak or do a single step to go back and check, uh, did I get my assumptions correct? You should be able to do one step at a time if need be, okay? So why though do I have this as my pattern? Why is the first thing I do check the existing? So in the Q&A, if somebody could tell me, why is it so important that I check the existing design first? So in the Q&A, why is that absolutely key? Somebody want to tell me why they think it's important. It's the first step. You have to check the existing pavement to find out what's been done over the years. What do you already have? You're going to use that structure almost assuredly. You're not going to build a road from scratch. It's very rarely done, especially in low volume roadways, though you could. But if you've got an existing pavement, you have to know, does that existing pavement have any life left to it? Because if you think about it, you've got an existing roadway. And if you do the calculations, you may realize an overlay, it's too late. This road's already failed. And if the roadway's already failed, then you can take out the idea of an overlay. So you have to start looking at a mill and fill. Well, when you do the calculations for the mill and fill, Maybe you realize even the subgrade doesn't have that much life left to it. It's going to start running on us. So I can't do that. I've got to go with a rehabilitation of the base, or I've got to do a total reconstruction. So the first step is to see what are your options in terms of the repair choices that you have available to you. So that's why it's critical that you do that first. Now, in terms of the critical variables, we've talked about those during the last hour. So let's make sure we're on the same page on what those critical variables are, okay? So obviously we have to know the pavement structure, which is another reason we need to know the existing, what materials are already there, what thicknesses are already there, how's the drainage? You know, there's lots of ways to measure that, but I'm a firm believer in the coffee cup system. Good, bad, and ugly is good enough. How old is that existing pavement? You can't analyze the existing pavement unless you know how long it's been there and exposed to traffic, which by the way, most of us don't probably have really good records for that. So we have to estimate that. You need to know something about the traffic and it's gonna be a mixed traffic. It's gonna have some trucks, it's gonna have some cars, some agricultural equipment, things like that. You have to know the growth. Gro obviously exponential growth over time does build up even at 1%, it grows some, okay? So you have to put a small growth factor in there. It's conservative, I know, for low volume roads, but probably not a bad thing. Wheel wander, for most low volume roads, we can use a standard wheel wander and we'd be in pretty good shape. So, okay. And uh, tra so that's important. And then of course, we talked a lot about the weather. Uh, daily changes, do we wanna do with that? Seasonality, um, and then long-term, everything changes over time, asphalt ages, stuff like that. So these are the critical variables we talked about in the last hour and are used in something like the Astro Design Equation and Design Guide. But 
I'm going to open up a poll. I think I have, I don't know if this is the last or the next to last poll. Let me just scan here. Yeah, I think this is the last poll. So what is different about low volume pavement design versus standard pavement design? You know, if you were designing Route 5 or the throughway or Route 79, the state, you know, State Highway 79, what's different about what we do in terms of designing a low volume road versus a high volume roadway? What would be different? I want you to think about that because it's important. What would be different? What do you think we can do differently on a low volume road versus a high volume roadway? Hmm. Nobody wants to take a take a stab at this particular problem. And it's active. Okay. Because this is important to understand there is a difference. It could be the depth of asphalt. We don't typically go with thick. So it's going to be thinner. And a thinner pavement means it's even more critical to get what we do know right. Because a small change in that thickness can make a huge difference. And by the way, that's in the Q&A to get on the poll. But yeah, a lot of it has to do with the variables we do know aren't as well defined. We don't know as much typically on a low volume road. So we have to make more assumptions. But the good news is some of the assumptions we can make are probably more than adequate, okay? So we can reduce the number of variables we deal with because we can deal with a little bit rougher pavement on a low volume roadway than we would on a high volume. So rather than having all of these variables we have to deal with, we can simplify with low volume, understanding they're still there but maybe we just put them into our tool. Just know that they're available. Where are the limitations, in other words? So the pavement structure. You know, in a pavement, you might have six, seven layers. But low volume road, we're probably going to limit it to two, three, maybe an overlay, so four layers. Okay, so we limit the pavement structure. When it comes to designing for traffic, we're going to probably just pick some general traffic based upon the total volume and in different kinds of vehicles that are on the roadway. And by the way, maybe we could do something similar to that Astro Little Green book. We're looking at land use as the driver of the traffic type, okay? You could look at the design life. The design life for a low volume road are probably not gonna be 50 years. So how long would you want that pavement to last? If you rebuilt a roadway in your community, how long would you like it to last? So what would be the design life? In the Q&A, if somebody could give me an answer on what you would, what do you think of as design life for a brand new pavement built from scratch? Twenty years I'm seeing a lot of, okay, 20, 20, 25, 20. Okay, typically we don't last as, don't think they have to last as long. But I will warn you, look at your overall network and realize how often do you actually get back to those roadways? <laughs> um, if you're only reconstructing or rehabilitating a mile a year and you got 100 miles of road, you probably need to be thinking even longer life than you're thinking. But yeah, we typically can go with a shorter life. Um, in terms of weather, uh, we probably don't necessarily need to do hourly calculations. So you know, that representative year is a nice concept because it simplifies the process. Just realize that if you get an extreme year, you may have issues that you missed, but we can get away with that for a pavement. Just realize that does happen. And then in terms of work types, what kind of work do you typically do on a pavement that changes its structure? I'm not talking to chip seal or crack repairs, which extend the life of the existing pavement and are absolutely critical. Maintenance is key. But what kind of work do you do on a pavement that changes its structure? 
the things we've talked about for the first two hours. What kind of work do you do? Again, throw that in the Q&A for me. What kind of work types are we going to be dealing with? Mill and fill. Yeah, Bobby, Bobby, I would say probably the most common technique we see around the state that changes the structure is a mill and fill. We mill off part or all of the asphalt surface, or at least get down to the second layer, and we put new asphalt down. In an urban area, it may even be required. You might have an overlay where you just, just put it right on top of the existing surface. You might have a rehabilitation where you stabilize the surface, and of course, you can always have reconstruction. So we've got a limited number of types for low volume roads. We don't get into some of the fancier techniques. Okay, so we're not doing injection under the concrete or anything like that. So keep it simple. So we'll go back to our process. We check the existing, we run the design, and then we tweak. Okay, the tool we came up with, one of the goals behind that tool was to speed the process up. The asphalt portion of the ASHTO MEPDG takes a while to run. A single trial can take five, 10 minutes even now with the most current version. I want something faster than that. So the current technique uh, will take about the time it takes for me to have a cup, of, go pour a cup of coffee and sit back down. So each step takes about a minute. Uh, the run to design you'll see is three minutes because it's actually doing three sets of calculations, but it doesn't take long, okay? So let's go through this idea of doing something I can do with a cup of coffee. Now there are some critical variables with limitations. So let's go back through these and talk about limitations. In terms of pavement structure, you, your closest half inch for any asphalt layer, closest three inches for any granular layer. Don't get more concise than that. Don't go crazy, okay? When it comes to traffic, when you do your count and you do your multiplication, do you remember those numbers? And we are gonna do a test here at the very end. Uh, round up a little bit. You know, if I've calculated 395 vehicles, I'm gonna put in 400. If I calculate 417, I'm gonna probably put in 425 or even 450, okay? Just get close and round up a little, be conservative. Design life, we've already talked about that. You could try out different numbers and see what happens. Okay, but the limitations probably not going to be valuable to go more than 40 or 50 years. I wouldn't trust this any tool really to do much longer than that. We just don't know what's happening. Change is going to be happening. Um, in terms of the weather, any tool that doesn't calculate every hour is going to have this problem. But even the ones that do, what happens in the future? What happens if we get a really, really cold winter and we get cracking because it gets so dang cold, or we get a flooding event or another Hurricane Agnes or Superstorm Sandy. We can only predict into the future so much. And then of course the work types, there's a limitation there as well, just in terms of what we might or might not do. So if you get outside the inference space of whatever tool you're using, please be aware of that and be very careful, okay? So what I want to do now is talk about each of the ones that we developed in this tool, which we're calling our Road PE LHI, Low Volume Highway Infrastructure. Okay. So for the pavement structure, you need to know the material types you've got. You need to know the existing thicknesses. Okay. You need to know the drainage at the site, and you need to know the age of the pavement. Okay. Hopefully you know these things. If you don't, you'll have to go out and do some testing but it's absolutely key that you know what you've already got, okay? Now, in terms of the layers, we decided we're gonna just limit it to three layers, a surface layer, bound or unbound, but a surface layer. Typically, combine all the asphalt together. If you've got a surface gravel, you could keep that separate. A base or unbound layer, because for low volume roads, the base is typically unbound and then a subgrade, no sub bases in this case. So a three layer system, okay? For the surface, again, you can have three types, cold mix asphalt, gravel surface, or hot mix asphalt. Now, when you're using this, it's a spreadsheet based tool. It uses Excel. 
Why did we decide to use Excel with code hidden behind, which you're welcome to get if you'd like to know what the code is. I'm glad to share it with anybody. Um, the reason we did it in Excel, we want everything to be exposed because we know this isn't the final tool. We know it could be tweaked and we want your feedback. So if you're using it and playing with it and you see something, say something, okay? When you do that, however, you'll notice something odd. Most people would have probably listed hot mix, then cold mix, and then gravel for the surface. Just logically, it makes sort of sense. I'm gonna go hot mix, cold mix, gravel for my surface. But every single case, because the way Excel works, goes easier, you have to code everything, uh, it's alphabetical. So when you're looking at the list, realize it's all alphabetical. So it's cold mix, gravel, hot mix, okay? And we went ahead and put in a lot of the variables for you. For the base, we got four choices. You got a clean gravel, crushed gravel or crushed stone. You got a dirty unbound base, which is wet and doesn't drain well. You got stabilized material where you've actually stabilized it with cement or asphalt. And that's important. We're talking about changing the structure, not just changing the frost susceptibility. If you're using calcium chloride stabilization, you can improve your drainage number, but don't change the base structure. The strength doesn't change really any. And then finally, uncrushed gravel that's clean is not quite as good as crushed gravel, but a lot of agencies have access to it and use it. So those are the most common. So that's what we went with. Simple list. And then the subgrade, got four choices. Clay-like, gravel-like, sandy, or silty. And for those who are like, well, I don't know what I've got. You could go with a big map. We gave you uh, in the tool and in the handout the AASHTO soil for classification for the whole state. And if you start looking around New York State, what you're gonna find is almost all of New York State falls into one of two categories. It's either gonna be silty, okay? Or it's gonna be sandy, okay? There are parts of the state that are gravelly, Adirondacks, and there's a few pockets of clay, but by far the dominant player here in New York outside of Long Island is silty. And if you're wondering, if you look on the map here, we actually have in the tool a link that shows you which is which, but the uh, blue, that's silty materials, okay? The A24 really is almost silty as astro classifications go. And we could spend half an hour just talking about soil classification. Um, the two cl big clay spots that exist here in New York State that uh, do have some clay soils over in uh, Jefferson County at the end of Lake Ontario. You'll see some in Washington County, the old Fort Edward, okay. But generally most of New York State is a silty blend of glacial till, okay. And then drainage, as our friend Jay Olson in his drainage picture with the ducks. We went through and we said, you know, you could calculate this, but truth be told, good, fair, or poor. Most of us know if it's good, fair, or poor. So we just select one of those. Again, it limits you in certain characteristics, but keep it simple. Now, in terms of traffic, as we were developing this tool, Ashto had come out with the little green book, the new version that we talked about last week. And so we realized something. Why not use that same concept? So instead of having you to calculate how many trucks and what kind of trucks and all that. We went through and we looked at the spectra that were available in the research and other places. And we said, let's define it the same way we did with the roads for geometry. So we have agricultural traffic with a lot of tractors and farm equipment and tends to be a little bit wider with big balloon tires, which typically have different pressures in them versus commercial, which is a lot of small single unit trucks and a lot of delivery vehicles and UPS and uh, people bringing food supplies versus industrial, which typically are, you know, large trucks, semi-tractor trailers, fairly heavy, high pressure tires, things like that, more trucks versus residential, uh, which let's be honest, what's the heaviest vehicle on a residential street? In the Q&A, somebody tell me, what's the heaviest vehicle on a residential street? Mm-hmm. 
it's the snowplow, <laughs> which, by the way, also shows up in the spring when the pavement is weakest. But yeah, but a, a much higher percentage of cars, some school buses get it thrown into the mix now, so we have to include them. And so it's a different mix. And if you're not sure, we did sort of go, well, you know, a lot of times it's really not one or the other. So we'll just do a sort of a, a standard low volume road that it's sort of a middle ground. About one eighth of the vehicles are considered non cars. Um, and the, the non cars vary from small single units all the way up to some semi tractors. Okay. So again, you could calculate the spectra. There are tools to do this. And in the MEPDG, the AASHTO tool, you can actually put in every type of vehicle. But even there, they have defaults. In fact, some of the defaults we used came right from that MEPDG. But we need to know the volume. You have to put that number. It's an important number. You estimate the volume. So how am I going to estimate the volume? Anybody have an idea of how I estimate the volume of, that I need to put in my tool? How am I going to estimate the volume of traffic? If anybody remembers that. Take the calculations we did last week, and they still work. You can use the same calculations. So if I'm in a rural area, I know that I've got about 15% in the busiest time of day. Okay. So I could go in, count for 15 minutes, and do all the calculations to make it a one-hour count, do 15%. Or if you remember, the multiplier for rural is 27. So this is rural. OK. And for urban, it's 11%. And the multiplier is 36. Yeah, so that technique still works. So you do the calculations for the total traffic, and then you just have to pick the type of traffic, agricultural, industrial, residential. Same kind of concept we used last week. And then we did something else, and this one is a key one. Now, we took out the small vehicles in terms of design, because as, as I said, from a structural standpoint, whether it's a pickup truck with a trailer, a uh, car or a motorcycle, structurally, they don't mean much. So we throw them out. And most design tools do this. They only start at buses, so category four. But we started doing the calculations, realized for low volume roads, unless there's special loads coming in, you could actually sort of lump everything into the semi-tractor category and reduce the number of classes, which reduces the number of calculations, speeds the process up. I will tell you, that's a limitation. If you have a area with a large number of heavy, heavy loads, like we saw earlier from Iowa or a special thing, you're going to need to do a special design. But this will get you close, because remember, for low volume, we can deal with a little bit more error than we can on a high volume roadway. The design life, we've already talked about that. So again, how long is it really going to last? I actually like to play around with it <laughs> a little bit. The bigger problem for me is the existing pavement. Do you really know how old that existing pavement is? So you can calculate its fatigue life. So you may have to tweak that a little bit, you know, get some estimates, talk to the people who've been there a while, and uh, be conservative, be conservative. In terms of uh, weather, you're going to deal with that seasonality. This tool that I'm showing you is a representative year tool. So it does the number of days of each season, even if they're not contiguous. And you actually need the average air temperature. Why do I need the average air temperature in my weather calculation? Why do I need the average air temperature? It's actually a very important number. And in the AASHTO MEPDG, they actually do hourly calculations for air temperature. Why does the air temperature matter? Why does air temperature matter? What they're really thinking about, Amanda, is lunch. It affects the characteristics of the asphalt layer, primarily. It does make a difference for freezing a little bit, but it turns out the primary thing is we worry about the, the asphalt layers. They get softer when it gets hot, OK? So again, we've got just cold mix and hot mix. We may have to tweak that. 
vitamin C, but it does affect that. So we use an average. It's not perfect. I'm not going to say that it is, but it gets you in the ballpark. And in terms of the number of seasons that we've given you to play with, we dropped it down to four. In our initial research we had done with uh, New York State DRT, we had five seasons, but we started realizing we really needed just four seasons um, because it turns out those are the critical ones for design and it keeps it simpler. So what you need to know is just the length of the various seasons. So let's go through those. Again, you've got all these, they're in your handout, they're in the tool itself. I'll show you the tool here in just a second, okay? So, you know, we calculated using uh, weather data for uh, both the past, and actually we did some projections using possible climate change numbers to calculate the number of different days for the different seasons. It turns out, by the way, climate change actually makes pavements last longer. Very counterintuitive. And there's some negatives with it, by the way, in terms of the asphalt mixes. We're gonna have to look at our asphalt mixes, but as it warms up, the number of freezing days and the number of thawing days actually goes down a little bit, the counterintuitive kind of thing. So the final tool actually uses the older set of data that we've got uh, because we're trying to be conservative for low volume roads. So we've got the number of winter days. And as you can see, that varies by a bit. The main thing there is that the good news for the North Country is the number of winter days, the pavement is frozen. It's actually stronger when it's frozen because it's stiff. So it actually lasts longer. Okay, uh, and then the winter temperature varies quite a bit. You know, downstate on the island, uh, there are parts down near uh, Southampton where the uh, average air temperature is, you know, 21 degrees and above. Uh, but you get up in towards Canada, you know, the temperatures can be down in the 12 to 14 degree Fahrenheit range. This is the single most important of the seasons. Um, the thaw length, we talked about this earlier, we did this. Um, this is the current version. We've updated the map slightly um, because the thaw is so critical. So down on the island, again, about a week, I typically would just put in seven myself, just be conservative. But as you get up into parts of the state, you know, you're talking seven weeks or more of number of seasonal days. And you just pull it right off the map. So if you're up where Tim is in uh, Lewis County, he would just come up here and, you know, he could just do Lowville and be in the middle of the county, but it does actually make a bit of a difference. Even from one end of the county to the other is a variation of about a week, okay? Now, one of the weird things when you do this, you first look at the map, you're like, what? The air temperature in the thawing period is the same across the whole state because it only varies from 32 to 36 degrees. But if you think about it, that's during that period when there's thawing going on before it's completely thawed. And it actually does make sense when you start thinking about it. It's just above freezing <laughs> on average during the course of the day with sunlight helping drive things. So yeah, it turns out you could probably put in 34 for the whole state and be fine. It really wouldn't change as much as you think. Uh, spring, this is how, you know, during the time when it's thawing and it's thawed, excuse me, and it's draining and all that, uh, quite a bit of variation affects the design some. And interestingly enough, spring is longer downstate. So we have a longer period of, of spring going on downstate because of the variations in the way that things work. And then the temperatures. Can you see where Lake Ontario and the Finger Lakes are? It actually changes the temperature regime quite a bit, okay? Now we don't give you the summer length because since it's the last season, it's calculated, but we do give you the summer temperatures. And again, you can see Lake Ontario, you can see downstate or warmer. Um, there's a little bit of influence in the Finger Lakes and all that. And then finally, we do give you frost steps. You need frost steps because if you don't have the frost step, you don't have the affected layer. That's just a single number. We take that into design. You do need to account for the frost step when you're doing the calculations, okay? And as you can see, the this is average frost depth over a 20 year period. And as you can see, this is under a road, by the way, not under the ground, because it doesn't go as deep under the ground. Um, but under the road, you know, we're talking four feet up in large parts of the North Country. Down Long Island, a foot, a foot and a half, probably just gets below the pavement surface for low volume road, okay? The type of work, we've already talked about this. 
There's only really four choices. We kept it simple. Overlays to reconstruction. And so one of the first things you do after you do the existing pavement is you can throw out certain designs and say, ah, I can't do an overlay. Uh, let's look and see what happens with a rehab, okay? Now, all of this sounds cool, but you're probably going, I got a lot of variables to deal with. How in the world am I gonna use all these things to calculate the asphalt thickness? Well, I got good news for you. You can actually take advantage of the same concept we use in artillery, where you can essentially bracket the answer and then pick a final solution. Now, to show you this, I've got a pavement and we're actually gonna play with one here in just a second. If you think about it, at my existing pavement, I do my calculation for my existing pavement and I get a line that says maybe 80, 85% of the pavement's life has been used up, okay? So in that particular case, let's check to see, could I put an overlay on this? Just an overlay with some crack repairs and would that be enough? So the minimum thickness you'd probably ever put down, even on a low volume roadway, if you're adding structure, is an inch and a half to two inches. So we said, okay, let's see what happens if you put in two inches, okay? So if you put in two inches, you do the calculations, and it's not thick enough, uh, you can actually see, and I need to change pin colors. Let's see if the computer will let me change to, I think, let's do, uh, we'll do, no, yellow's not gonna be bright enough. I'll do purple. Uh, yeah, actually, I'll go blue. I'm gonna go blue. Um, yeah, there we go. So they, if you do it with two inches, you're actually uh, well above 100%. You've lost too much pavement. So you now that's not good enough. But let's put in six inches. Well, if I do six inches, you know, I really, I got plenty of life left. I've reduced the stress in the existing pavement enough. It's going to be down under 100%. So what you could do is, in the real world, it's curved. It's actually a curved line, slightly curved. I'm exaggerating it a little bit to show you this. In the actual calculations, the curve is there. You can see it. But just draw a straight line between the two, okay? And then where that line crosses, the 100% point, okay, that becomes your existing pavement thickness, okay? So that becomes your new design thickness. And you could just check that, okay? Now, this tool is, again, it's conservative. It's low volume, works pretty well. So in this case, we would calculate about 4.5 inches of asphalt needed. In, if you wanted to tweak it, you could check. You'd actually find out that four inches is probably enough, okay? But it's a, it's a pretty simple. So at the end of the day, we try to say, well, you know, closest half inch is good enough. We're not gonna be paving any finer than that. So we round it to the closest half inch. And it's actually a pretty, pretty good, simple tool to use. Covers all the stuff, it's mechanistic empirical. Let me show you the tool. Uh, there it is. So we're gonna do an example. And I'm actually gonna blow this up just a little bit. You zoom to selection. There we go. Should be big enough now for you, for you to be able to see it. Okay. So essentially, the spreadsheet you can download it has a engine behind it that does the calculations. You do need to have that engine installed. So there's a in self-installing zip file that you'll download. You'll put in your information about your location, uh, who did the design, the date. We always recommend, please put the name of the date of the designer so you know who did it and when they did it. You put, first put in the existing roadway. So you need to know the thickness of the asphalt layer. You need to know whether it's uncrushed or crushed pavement, okay? So these are all things you have to be aware of. You need to know what kind of subgrade soil. And in this case, all you have to do is pick a drop-down list that pops right up. You don't have to remember these things, they pop right up for you. And there's a 
information that helps you, that tells you what you need to know. Blue cells must be filled out. Green cells, you do a drop down. Yellow, you can modify things, things like that. And if you need more details, just click on the help and up will come. Up. It still says draft on it. I want to make a final version of this. It hasn't really changed. I would I'd send it to somebody for a review and hadn't heard back. So I just need to go ahead and finalize that. It's not going to change. So go ahead and use it. It's a couple of years ago we did this. OK. Um, so again, it tells you those same things. ABC in terms of calculation. So first thing you do is you put this in in terms of site inputs. You don't have to use the handout. They're right here. We gave you all the maps you need. They're available for you. So you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. OK, and when you're done, you just go back to the inputs page. OK. So you scroll down here, you put in your design life. I put in 25 years for this example. Three inches of cold mix is already there, 12 inches of base. Um, using the state DOT's default of 1% growth. And my traffic type, I'm just going to assume a standard traffic type. OK, and if you're interested in the amounts, we give you everything. You can actually go in here and play around with it and look at what the user inputs, what they are. Nothing in here is hidden on purpose. We want your feedback. So now you come down here. You could start with the design inputs. I don't usually put those in until after I've done a check. They're there if you want, because it's going to ignore them in the first cycle. The first thing you do is you check the existing. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click on check existing. OK. And I hit the button. And it says, do you really want to check the existing design? The calculations will take approximately a minute. OK. So I'm going to say yes. It depends on your computer. OK. Now, you'll get this lovely screen that's got these little teeny tiny numbers that nobody can read. I can't read them. But we did that on purpose. We want every calculation to be seen. And when it's doing the calculations, you'll see this screen right here. That's sort of a way to say, just wait for it. It'll be back. It'll take you back to the initial screen. And it does. It takes about one minute to do all these calculations. Because what it's doing is for every type of truck, it's got an assumed traffic. For every type of season, it's got that. So it has to do a calculation for each season, each truck type, each axle for each truck type. So. Each one of those cells you see in the purple bands is a calculation. The orange bands and the pink bands go with them. There's certain classes. You know, we don't have triaxles for certain classes of trucks, but it's doing these calculations. It's calculating the strains at those critical locations for the pavement under the bottom of the surface and the top of the subgrade. And it's adding up all of those D factors. And it's going to come up with a D percentage lost for that existing pavement. And the better your data going in, the better the data coming out. So if you think the pavement's been around for 15 years, it's actually 20, you're going to be off by quite a bit. So it is important to get as good a data as possible in here, because otherwise you can have yourself a bit of a problem. So we're coming up on uh, just a little over a minute. And one of the things I have learned with my computer, I don't know why it does this, I have to usually reboot it about midday because it's slow, but there it's back. OK, so in this particular case, you can see it says we've lost 78% of the life of the asphalt, and we've lost 43% of the life of the subgrade. OK, so the existing pavement at 78%, we expect to see a little cracking, but not a lot. It should match your expectations. I've actually used that to decide if I really like my existing life. If you've got a roadway that's got a lot of cracking on it, and you run this and it says 78% on the asphalt surface, you're like, mm, I got something wrong. So you want to tweak that. You're going to want to change that. You want to modify that. OK? Then what you could do is come in here, and you can run the design. OK, and you can hit the run design button. OK, now it's going to take longer for it to run. So I'm going to start running it. And the thing is, I can hide it and run it in the background, which is pretty neat. 
So I'm going to run the design and it's going to check it once at two inches. It's going to check it another time at six inches and it's going to triangulate the actual thickness. Okay, so I'm going to let it run. I'm going to say yes. It's going to take three minutes this time, though actually, again, whatever reason my computer gets slow, so it's probably going to take us a little more than that, about four minutes. And while it does that, I'm going to actually come back over here to my slideshow. And I'm going to go back over here to the next slide. Once it decides to let me. And we're going to do a couple of questions while it's running in the background. So it should take about four minutes. So we got a couple of PDH questions and just some things I want to remind you of. And then we're going to do a quick case study and finish up the design calculation. So in the Q&A, if somebody could tell me, what are the critical strain locations for thickness design in the pavement? There's lots of them, but we're using two in particular for low volume roads because they're the most common and they're the most critical. So what are the critical locations for the strains in the thickness design for the pavement? Top and sub base, surface and sub base, front and back wheel, Anybody else want to give me an answer here? Top and sub base. But it's not just the top, it's actually the sub grade that we care about, not the sub base. And there is a difference. Okay. So it's the locations of the critical strains. And as soon as my computer, again, is running two things at once. So the location of the critical strains. One of them is the tension the tension, the pulling force in the asphalt surface, which is typically under the wheel load or close to it, though it can be caused, you can get cracking due to radial tires. And then this vertical strain that causes rutting on the subgrade, right on top of the subgrade, okay? There are things with the gravel layers, the base layers, but it's the subgrade we care about, okay? Okay, my next one here. We'll do that one and then our tool should be done by the time I'm done with that. How many passes by a standard automobile are needed to equal the damage of one fully loaded 10 wheel dump truck? And again, I'll let, let's just throw some answers into the Q&A for me. How many passes by a standard automobile are needed to equal the damage of one fully loaded dump truck? Ten thousand. Okay, that's the upper limit, remember, because that assumes that we have the same number of wheels. Okay. And so that's the upper limit, but because there's extra wheels, that number is a little bit lower, okay? So it's typically in the four to 6,000 range is the number we typically use, okay? So I'll give you the 10,000 is the upper limit, but if somebody were to really put my head to it, I'd say five would be a probably more reasonable number to use. And again, it can vary as low as 4,000, even for a fully loaded dump truck. And in the winter, by the way, the amount of damage is so small, it doesn't really matter. Okay, why is it critical to examine the existing pavement as part of any thickness design? Why is it critical? Why is it critical to examine the existing pavement as part of any thickness design? You gotta make sure you're using the correct assumptions. It helps you know the history of the fixes and the failures, okay? Something helping you with, it can actually help you determine whether you've got good information if you know something about its history. And it allows you to determine how much payment life is remaining 
and if the existing payment will still fail during the life of an overlay or a mill and fill. In other words, can I do a mill and fill or an overlay, or do I have to do something more extensive like a rehabilitation or a total reconstruction? Because, you know, a payment that looks like this, it's probably too late versus a payment that looks like this. Okay, so let's go back to our tool. And it's popped back for me. Okay. And sure enough, it calculated it out. And we actually give you the graph. Okay, so we gave you all the data points we calculated. So two inch was above 100%. Six inches was less than 100%. And so it drew a straight line between the two in our log log space. I love that log log space, or in this case, actually a semi log space. Um, I won't get into the reasons for the math on that one. It just gets you a better result. Um, and so in this particular case, if you do the calculations, the actual actual calculations would get you a little bit less than um, three and a half, so it calculates it, rounds it up to three and a half inches, okay? And so the total life left, the existing life plus the future life, it calculates 89% life lost. And it does for each layer. And one of the things you find with a lot of overlays when you start doing the math is the overlay itself isn't what fails. Even when you start seeing cracks coming through the asphalt surface, the actual problem is the cracks underneath have reflected back up through the asphalt overlay. The real failure occurred in the existing pavement. And we tend to do that way too often with our overlays. We tend to get there in too late. Now you can tweak these. You can say, you know, 89%, I said earlier, I want my D value to be as close to one as possible. And I've obviously got a pretty good situation in terms of the life of the surface is where it's failing. So what happens if I put in four inches? Well, you can do that. You don't change it down at the bottom, you change it up here in the design inputs, I can actually put in different inputs. So by changing this, I could, I could change it from an overlay to a mill and fill, I could do a rehab, I can do a total reconstruction, and you can change these numbers, these inputs. So I could say for my overlay, three and a half inches was what the computer calculated. I think I'd like to see what happens with four inches. And by the way, you could also do this by checking gravel. You can actually put gravel as a surface. This tool is designed to give you asphalt thicknesses, but if you wanted to check it for gravel, you could do each step individually and just put this number in there and it would calculate it for you. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna tweak it. I'm gonna hit one uh, step and it's gonna ask me, do I really wanna do a single step? Uh, yeah, I do wanna do a single step. So I'm gonna go ahead and let it run. And then while it's running, I'm going to go back to our slide deck. And I want to do a quick case study with you. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do all the calculations for this because we got about five minutes. But what I really wanted to do is a cold in place. A cold in place would be considered a mill and fill in this case. So you actually do that. If you were getting into the base, you'd call that a rehab. And yes, you could do that. Um, you do, could do cold in place. You would just keep it as cold mix. And it does whatever surface you've got. If it's cold mix surface, it stays cold mix. If it's hot mix, it stays hot mix. Uh, the next version, we may change that. But this current version is cold mix. Uh, Tim asked the question, is cold mix, cold in place recycling considered? You would count that as a mill and fill. And I would tweak that in that case. I would actually purposely do the calculations as a mill and fill. And then you could tweak it a little bit. But that, that's what I would count it as a mill and fill. Yeah, recycling in that case. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is a quick case study. So in this case, we have a roadway with the traffic volume. Um, I went out in the morning and I calculated 26 vehicles. Okay. Um, I've got some agricultural trucks. Okay. I've got an industrial complex nearby. What is the traffic type? What is the traffic type? And just so we can have on the screen here, once my computer lets me, these are the choices that are inside the tool. So which traffic type would you use? Now, what is the traffic volume that you're gonna have? So you might call that industrial, okay? 
what would you be looking for to decide if it was just a standard low volume road or if it's commercial or industrial or even agricultural? What would you do to know that? Because it's pretty important. It does make quite a bit of difference. If you do the actual play around with it, try the different traffic types, you can see. You can see the difference between the different traffic spectra, as they're called. You'd have to go out and look at the number and the type of heavy vehicle. So you might need to do more than a 15-minute count. I usually start with the standard, but if you're not sure, you might have to go out and do a more than a 15-minute count to see what kind of mix you've got. Um, you might be able to talk to somebody who lives along the roadway and get a sense, but be careful. They might have their, I don't like all the trucks kind of thing going on, but look and see. I mean, the industrial complex may or may not be using this particular roadway. If they are, then yeah, you might want to call it industrial. If it's mostly just agricultural, let that drive things. You can tweak and put in your own mix, but I usually just start with what's already there. Again, start with what you've got and go from there. Did anybody calculate what the... Uh, Total traffic for the day was, by the way? Anybody calculate the total traffic for the day? Does anybody remember what that calculation is? Let me go check my pen color real quick. Somebody got 420. Anybody agree with 420? Somebody else got 693. Of course, it may make a difference of uh, whether it's considered rural or urban. Okay, so this this is pretty rural. So it's 26 times 27, because that's the rural number. And that comes out at technically 702. Um, and this is one case where I'm probably just gonna call that 700. You want to round it up to make that 710. Okay, fine. But yeah, keep it simple. So we can do this for geometry. We can do this for thickness. Let's go back to our tool and see what happened. When I reran the calculations with a four inch, okay, um, you know, I can get away with maybe a little bit different thickness in this particular case. I could try tweaking it down as little as three inches and see what happens. You can play around with these numbers a little bit and see what happens. And it doesn't take that long. And again, change things out, try them out. It does take about, as I say, with a modern computer. And this, this one's about two and a half, two, two years old. I can't remember exactly what when it was built. Um, I think it's two and a half. It takes about a minute to do each step. So the initial step takes a minute. The three checks, the full calculations, three minutes. And then if you want to tweak it, it takes one minute. So in our last minute together, I'm going to let this run, but I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Um, any last questions before we let you go? And for those getting PDHs, we'll be sending those to you if you stay for 90%. Everybody else, if you were there three quarters, you'll get a certificate of attendance. Um, and with that, um, no more questions coming in. I don't see anything. Okay. Well, I will, while this thing runs in the background, I will go back here. So you have my contact information. So there, if you do have a question, please feel free. You can just email it to us, send it to our website. I thought the website was on here. It was on, you know. Uh, Amanda's going to magically put our website into <laughs> the chat pod so you can uh, go in there and uh, get our website address. So she's magically going to pop it in there for me. See, there it goes. Oh, she just grabbed the old one, but it works. Uh, question that came up, and then I'm going to open up the uh, spreadsheet tool one more time. How do you know when to go from gravel to asphalt? Again, that's that thing we talked about last week. Um, when you go from that really comes down to more than just the structure. It comes down to other factors. And we have a gravel manual that's on our website under our publications page that actually outlines the steps that you'd really wanna to follow to do that. 
So I'm going to just very quickly, because I know exactly where it is, and it's faster than me just doing anything else. I'm going to pull that up, copy link, and I'll throw that into the into the chat pod for anybody who's interested. Okay, there it is. And that at the back of that book, it's actually from South Dakota's LTAP Center. You can actually find um, stuff like that. So. Okay, so that should hopefully help you out uh, to figure out when to go from asphalt to concrete. And again, you can just go to our website and go from there. So let's look at our spreadsheet and I'll let y'all go. I did three inches and at three inches, I'm still okay. I'm at 93%. I'm getting in the ballpark where I'd like to be. Okay, I've done this game at two inches. I know what's gonna happen at two inches. It's gonna be 109. And at two and a half inches, it's going to be right on the margins. So I might be able to do as low as two and a half inches. But most of the time, we'll round up a little bit and we'll be conservative. So with that, we're a little past noon. I apologize for two, stealing two minutes of your day. But uh, let us know if you have any questions. And again, there's my email address. Please feel free to send me an email or go on our website and ask any questions that you've got. With that, uh, everybody have yourself a great day. Stay cool the next few days. It's going to be in the 80s. Uh, might even get in the 90s. And stay safe. Take care.